Hello YouTube, how are you? We'll be uh, bringing our Twitch friends in and we'll get on with this silliness uh, in just a second or two. Here we go. Well, hi everybody. Welcome to Stratosphere Studio. I'm back with uh, Captain James T. Kirkland Starship Enterprise and uh, our friend the Gorn Captain who has been out of commission for quite a while now. I know a lot of people have been asking over about his health and uh, he seems to be doing fine. He's quite a tall chap actually. Um, and um, Hank Justice, cool name ever. Uh, says, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Hank Justice is a little widow that says go watch Dune. I've heard it's good, we'll go see it. Uh, anyway, it's good to be here. Hope everybody's doing well as usual. Um, I arrange my windows here. Um, like I said, he's quite a big guy, this uh, Gorn Captain. Um, and um, and so in commemoration of the uh, Gorn Captain making his return to uh, the background here in Stratosphere Studio, he'll, uh, in the not-too-distant future, be moved over there when we get the um, um, store mechanics done. But uh, we do have a, a special... Um, uh, Remember a t-shirt to celebrate this great occasion. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorites. You ready? All right, here we go. Ready? This is, I, I just, I saw this and I just had to get it. Here we go. Ready? Okay, here we go. Is that epic or what? I love it. I love it so. Uh, let me show you how big, um, how big the Gorn Captain is. He's, uh, he's quite a strapping chap, actually, as you can see. Um, big guy. But, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's about to hit the gym. I love that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, uh, there you go. A lot of people are talking about uh, Dune now, and some are saying, yeah, not that good. Zendaya was the biggest L for that movie, says Joseph Talbot. I didn't, I, I kind of thought she looked a little, I don't know, severe. Um, I'm, I'm, I get the, you know, I mean, I thought Sean Young, when Sean Young was in her prime, was, when Sean Young wasn't in her prime, Sean Young was just spectacular. But, um, and uh, and uh, yet she just seems in the um, in the trailers and in the first movie. I just there was nothing about her I I, I liked. Just seems very kind of what an expression kind of err err we're oppressed we're the, err, err. it's kind of a one note kind of thing. Um, but uh, I am looking forward to seeing the movie. So um, I don't have all four of them printed. I've got uh, see this. Out. So this is, uh, in this particular case, is uh, episode three of um, the fullback, about 80 pages. Episode one is out with uh, Shelley getting red. Uh, here's a whole nother, uh, this is episode one is called State Champ, episode two is... Uh, not blank pages either, not just done for effect. This is called um, Balloon Buster. Episode, sorry, episode two is called Yellow. Episode three is called Balloon Buster. And episode four is called The Stand. Could never get away with calling the movie The Stand, but I can get away with the fullback part four, The Stand. So, um, one, two, and three have been submitted, and I've just got another day or two of hashing out the. Uh, formatting and making a final pass for errors and stuff on episode five and then it will be submitted um will tsl and tss get posted on apple podcasts again i i can say for sure tsl will believe it or not i've got something like 20 of them backed up now that need to be posted individually we're dealing with the um youtube is the saved youtube versions but i have a higher quality version that i record at home I haven't had a chance to do anything uh for the last, good lord, three months, just other than work on this thing, and even then it's been like 
insane. But uh, hey, you know, we will. Um, I'm I'm submitting files, so episodes one, two, and three will go in today. Uh, first draft of uh, the four-part series, and then um, after that, uh, probably another day or two. It's the fourth one is written. It's just not submitted yet. I've got just a couple bit of formatting and spelling things. So there is an end in sight here. Although God knows how many times I've said that. So I'm not making any promises anymore. Uh, but you, as you could see, when you put them all together, well, let's see. I think I did this earlier. Hang on. Just uh, when I submitted it, uh, hang on. Yeah, it's here. Hang on a second. So, how much writing did I end up doing on this thing? Well, I ended up doing uh, this much writing. I ended up doing... that much. Hang on there, uh, YouTube. Yeah, so that's uh, that's how much writing I've done um, on this thing. And the bottom one, the fourth one, is about uh, halfway printed, but pretty much written. So it only took me four times as long as I thought it would. But then again, um, well, let me rephrase that. It took me twice as long as I thought it would. And, uh, it, uh, and I wrote four times the amount of stuff. So actually, I'm ahead. I have a super chat there from Littleton uh, saying... Um, Thank you for bringing Frank's story to so many people. The best is yet to come. Bless you for that, Weddleton, sir, or madam. Um, I really, those are the kind of things I really need to hear uh, sometimes. So uh, they, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, it was uh, a lot of stuff. And uh, since this is our, our entertainment show, I can talk about this a little bit more with, with a little, you know, a little less guilt here. Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jeff Newcomb says, Newcomb says, we love you. We, we love you, Bill. Please go to work for Jeremy. You can't even bring the drink and the hippie. You can even bring the drink and the hippie with you. We, we love <laughs> that. I guess that would be the drunk and the hippie. We love them too. Yeah. Um, there's a lot to be said for that, uh, theory. And I, and I gave that, uh, some very serious thought and I continue to give it serious thought. But right now, I think the relationship is actually pretty comfortable. And the, the proof will be in what happens in the, after, after this week. Because after this week, it will be out the door. Um, so two things will, will happen then. One, one I have control over, the other one not so much. The one I do have control over is I'll be able to get back to all these things that I talked about doing and been looking forward to doing and have the studio set up to do the story mechanics interviews and um, uh, things to come and all the rest of those things that I've had to put on hold just in order to finish this thing and get it out the door. Um, but the main thing is the, the compliment about, um, about bringing Frank's life to people. You know, I, I, when I sent the, um, the three scripts in today, I said, look, I know this has taken an awful lot longer than I thought it would. And, and things always take longer than I thought it did, would, that that's bill time. But this was different. Um, this story wrote itself. I didn't write it. I just typed it. Uh, those of you who've ever gotten lost in a big project, I'm sure Eric Lake knows what that's like and several other people out there who are writers or professional writers or people who've ever had to work on something like this. Uh, one of the things that just flew into my head is a, a, a one of the reasons why this is one of the reasons why it's taking so long that every time I predict it's about to be over, I look like a fool. I'm reminded of an expression in home building airplanes. Um, when you built an airplane from a kit or from plans, the, what usually, um, virtually every time happens is all the big stuff gets built first. So and that's actually pretty smart because you feel like you're making real progress, you know? You're in there working for a month or two, and you've got wings, and you've got landing gear, and you got the thing assembled, and you got a canopy on it, and it's looking like, man, this thing's coming along. 
and all of the little details, all the wiring and all the rest of that stuff and the, and the testing and the engine and the fuel systems and all of that stuff still ahead of you. So home builders say, uh, yep, 90% done and 90% to go. And that's basically the way this thing uh, really feels. You know, it's 90% done and 90% to go. That's, that's what bit me on it. But um, I really love it. I love it. I, I, I just do. I love it. Um, I when I again when I submitted the, the first three episodes today, I said um, I thought I was writing a war movie. I ended up writing a buddy story, a really good buddy story, I might say. A family morals film. I wrote a decent love story. I wrote an action flick. I wrote a historical documentary. I wrote um, I wrote a, a, a political thriller, and I wrote a, a Greek tragedy with a with a, a tragic with a with a with an epic character, a tragic character with a tragic flaw, a fatal tragic flaw. Um, uh, I'm going to have to put these on, sorry. It's not that I'm vain about the glasses. I kind of like the glasses. It just throws a lot of reflections up on my eyes. Um, the Decimator said, who else listened to The Way I Heard It episode with Bill in it? I did. Um, I thought my mic sounded really quite, quite kind of underwater there. But... I spent a time, a fair amount of time, list, uh, talking about the Frank Luke story there, and um, and I, and the reason that I, this thing just keeps, yeah, it's essentially over now. But the reason that it kept receding was because every time I get to a new scene, I just go drilling deeper and deeper into it. And like I said, it, it would write itself. Um, the uh, I was talking about the mic on the um, on the micro show, the mic mic. Um, this one hopefully sounded good. Um, the uh, Darth Chuck the Merciless. Unfortunately, we were two men down at work. Hmm. In any event, um, the uh, This, this Frank Luke story is really um, just becoming something I'm, I'm just crazy mad in love with. Largely because of, like I said, when, when I say things, when say story writes itself, especially when you get to um, uh, dialogue for some reason. I know I've got to, I'm going to do this scene and then I've got a little scene in front of that and then I start this conversation and the conversation just gets so interesting that I just kind of roll with it and I realize no you just made a point that you really needed to make and it pretty much effortlessly and 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 it's clever and it's interesting it's the main thing is it's interesting but the the biggest point is I you know I went into this really liking Frank Luke enough to want to spend you know better part of it of an entire year on him and then um, and then I found out that the, the guys that I really like the most especially is uh, Joe Werner uh, who was Luke's friend and um, and I just love the way he came out I, I, I feel like I really caught him um, and if, if Frank Luke has been forgotten then, then, then Joe Werner is you know, completely forgotten. I'll tell you one thing I did do um, that was really tough. Uh, I had, and I love, I love Joe Joe Werner in this. I love Frank Luke, obviously. I love, love, love writing for Eddie Rickenbacker. I love, I love it. That Rickenbacker grin is so tremendous. He's so fun you know he's, he's he's glamorous without trying to be glamorous he's just from every picture i've ever seen of him he always just seems so upbeat and so optimistic i've seen one picture of him where he wasn't smiling and and he's kind of like this dynamo in this movie uh there's a guy who's one of frank luke's allies major hartney who, who took him under his wing is a is a really interesting character um He's Canadian, but he, he basically joined the war at the beginning in 19, 
14, I think, started flying in 1915 with the Royal Flying Corps. So he gets to have a lot of the British RAF mannerisms and some of the, you know, chaps occasionally, not, not a lot of chaps, but, you know, um, he gets to, he speaks like a guy who was well-educated in a British private school system. Precisely, yes, correct, precisely. Um, and then there's this guy, Jerry Vasconcells, who who was supposed to be the commander of the 27th, and they gave it to this Martinette Grant. And Grant is interesting. Grant is not likable, but he's interesting, and he's and he's right. And Luke's right. And that's when you know you got something worth doing, you know? Um, when when you can tell both sides of the story and, and have both ends of, the, of a viewpoint on something, and be able to say, you know, that guy's got a point. That guy's got a, got, a, got a point, too. That's interesting drama, I think. It's so easy. It's the antithesis of woke, or for that matter, any other kind of ideologically driven writing, right? This kind of trash, although this was an ideolo ideologically written story, um, the ideology I was interested in was just that sense, and what I really feel like I captured, if I do say so myself, after all of this back padding here, but as we wind this thing down finally, what I realized was 1918, 1917, 1918, America was at, wasn't at its height of its powers, but I think it was probably at the height of its moral arc. That one of the many things I did um, looking at this, getting ready for this, although I came to, came to it very late, um, I had a scene where I thought, okay, I need these guys in their hangar. They need to be listening to something on their on their Victrola. So I start looking for the number one hit of, you know, 1918, and it's over there. And I thought, oh, come on, I don't want to do over there. Everybody does over there. Well, it was the number two hit as well or something, two you know, different versions of it. So I basically thought, okay, you got these four guys who are sitting there singing. They're working on some tedious thing. They're basically reloading their ammunition and greasing each one of the rounds and putting it back in the ammo belt so they don't jam. I'm not talking about Wilson. Wilson was a well. Wilson was a moralist. He was a kind of a prig and a and a racist and a and all all the rest of it. But the but the the fundamental idealism of America just seemed to have been peaked there. And um, I saw, I went back and looked at some scenes, I didn't see the whole thing, of what is, depending on your viewpoint, the, the, the one of the most idealistic American movies, or the corniest, depending on where you're coming from. But I took a look at, um, at uh, Yankee Doodle. Um, I think that's it, Yankee Doodle Dandy? The Jimmy Cagney movie, the story of uh, uh, George Cohen. And, um, yeah, it's a, maybe it's a Johnny Get Your Gun thing. It changes. Uh, and and I watched them sing in it in the end of this movie, which was made, I think, right around World War II, about World War One, And, um, yeah, and Sergeant York, there's another one. Audie Murphy's World War II guy was Sergeant Young. But these, but the, York, but these guys were, um, these guys were, uh, they were just so sure of themselves, you know, and that song over there is it really put a put a lot of um, direct motivation into me because I don't know it, it sums up the way I think about America to this day, and that is basically look we really would just like to be left alone here, you know, we'd really just like to not have to deal with any of this. Don't make us come over there. But if you do, you know, you know, over there, over there, spread the word, spread the word over there, that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums drum drumming everywhere. It's, 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 it's just so, um, sure of itself and that and and my favorite part of that song actually is is just at the very end of that of that refrain you know uh, spread the word spread the word to beware 
that it's over we're coming over and we won't come back till it's over over there i'm not giving up my day job to pursue a career in singing especially when i'm not warmed up but um but it's oh when they were saying we'll be over and it's over when we decide that we're going to get involved with this thing then it's over we're not coming home until it's over over there it's like there's a gigantic mess over there which is where we came from and we're going to go and fix it and then we're coming home that seems to be be the story of this country kind of thing um road rider says well put a boot in your ass that's the american way we're not going around looking to kick people in the butt we're just saying if you can't get this thing under control if it's just plain another uh, these endless european wars to the point where we're involved with it you're sinking our ships you know lusitania and 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 and, and, and plus you know there there was a right and a wrong side of that and it wasn't as clear as it was in world war ii but you know and i don't know i mean you make a much better moral case for world war ii than world war one uh and our involvement in it but even world war ii didn't have that kind of religious um it, it's like if you look at if you look at this these three big events you look at the civil war world war one and world war ii world war one comes between existential crises of the, of the civil war and world war ii world war one was not an existential threat to this country but, and we sat out most of it. And one of the reasons that the, the victories that we had, including the, Fra the victories that Frank Luke was such a big part of, the um, St. Mihail salient um, and the uh, Meuse-Argonne offensive, we just rolled over the Germans. That's because the Germans had been fighting for four years and we had been fighting for four months, essentially. And um, we just rolled them over and, and and the Germans were the this the evidence you can find everywhere um, that well, what the one guy the single most important two most important guys that really counter Hindenburg and especially Ludendorff who basically said no once the Americans started coming over in, in numbers it was all over and um, and it just completely demoralized these Germans who'd been fighting in these trenches for four years as had the French as had the British as had the Russians for most of it and um, Russia got out of the war right about the same time we got into it. And there was this, there was this George Cohen belief in the country as an idea that was not quite the religious sort of um, Johnny comes marching home kind of, of the Civil War and not, all, and also not the, you know, the um the kind of swagger in world war ii it was just this kind of i mean the 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 um Mus argon offensive that killed frank luke because he was basically flying combat during that offensive over the lines um killed twenty five thousand americans just that one offensive and that's a lot of guys you know that's that's what six Iraq Iran uh, Iraq well, Freudian slip that's like six Iraq Afghanistan wars which went on for 15 years total losses and that that happened in the space of you know it's a couple weeks. That's a lot of guys in a in and somebody says a third of Vietnam. Steve Whoop says yes, ish. And Vietnam was eleven years. This was eleven weeks. Um, and we we took these losses like everybody else in that miserable, god awful worst war in all of history. There's no place worse than World War One. It's the worst place to be. It's the worst place to be in the air. It's the worst place to be on the ground. It was just unmitigated, un un. Demit, just undiluted hell. It was just, just the worst. Um, and yeah, and so who's it? 
pointed that out. Uh, Fire Oiko says the top aces were Luftwaffe, so most of the aces in a day were aces. So were most of the aces in a day. The reason that the Germans had um, more kills than the Allies, well, first of all, the Germans basically didn't have to split their kills with the Austrians. There, I'm sure there were some Austrian aces, but I swear I've never heard of one. So one side of the war, you've got nothing but German aces, and they're not going home. They don't get to go home. They fight until they die. Although that was true for the British and the French aces as well. But in World War II, one of the, I think the top scoring ace of, of the war, of all wars, was a guy who fought on the um, Eastern Front. I think he had something like 240, 249 kills or something. Rick Toppin had 80. Ernst Dudet, I think, ended with 62 or something along that line. Um, uh, was it Eric Hartman? Is that his name? Yeah. Um, one of the first guys to die in this movie is shot down by um, not Ernst Dudet, but by one of his wingmen. And then I've, I've got his name somewhere, Hauptmann, I want to say. I'm not 100% sure of this. So the guy who kills Werner was very much like a German Frank Luke, came out of nowhere, fought for, was in the war for months, nothing happened, and then just boom, all of a sudden he's just knocking off aces. Now here's the thing that was so hard for me to make a decision on. Towards the, the very last week, I mean, this is like a week ago, as I'm wrapping this thing up here finally. I'm finally at the point where we're dealing with the, the actual history of the actual combat and, you know, that incredible run, that 17-day 17, 17 run. And I'm looking at this, and I knew I knew Eddie Rickenbacker was the ace of aces of the war, and I knew, I knew from the beginning that Frank Luke had surpassed him and all the rest of it. And I'm in the middle of this, and all of a sudden this name crops up, and I'm like, oh, my God. First of all, I'd never heard of the guy. And secondly, I have to deal with this. And his name was David Putnam. Um, Putnam was America's ace of aces. Rickenbacker had six kills, Putnam had 11. By the time Putnam died, he had, I think it was 20-something confirmed kills, 18, 19, something like that. Now, it must have been about 17 or 18, because Luke eventually passed him. But they say he probably got 30. And he was the leading ace. He, was, he had double Rickenbacker score. So I've got this thing all set up where Frank comes in and arrives at the station, I mean, at the, at the field, Rickenbacker is an international star. He's a star before, um, yeah, Hartman had 352 allied kills, which means you could probably add another 40 onto that, 20 or 30 in terms of confirmations and stuff. So Putnam, I'd never heard of him. And, and he was three times Rickenbacker's score. So I had a point there where I had to say to myself, I had to ask myself a very, very serious question. And, that, and this was the question. I got this great friendly rivalry between Frank Luke and Eddie Rickenbacker. Who's going to be the top ace? Who's going to be the top ace? Who's going to be the top ace? And next thing I know, it's like Rickenbacker's not the top ace. It's Putnam. And there were other guys who held it for a short period of time, but it was basically Putnam. And I looked him up and it's like, well, that's a strange, interesting face that I've never heard of. And he was um, no Eclipse talk yet. Uh, we were expecting that we would drive out. I talked to Natasha last night. It looks like we'll probably fly, um, and we'll sort out the details of that. I know we still got time. We will be there in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for the eclipse, and, and we will, we will, I'm, right now it looks like we'll get there on the 7th, spend the night of the 7th and the night of the 8th there, and then back on the 9th. Um, but, uh, I had this, this perfectly balanced Rickenbacker, Luke story going and then I had to ask myself oh here's here's where Frank Luke challenges America's leading ace Eddie Rickenbacker well, he wasn't the leading ace and I have to ask myself do I want to open up this can of worms or not it's so balanced it's so perfect it's so clear you know to not have him in it just just and, I, and I'm thinking look just just drop it it's it's not relevant to the story it's just it's 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 muddying muddying up the story just drop it and then i then i said to myself isn't that the problem though i mean isn't that the reason you did america's forgotten heroes in the first place billy 
You know, how can you, how can you drop it? No one's ever heard of him. He's a real guy. He was, he was twice Rickenbacker's score when he was killed. But the thing that's especially interesting, and, uh, and this is what put me over the top on it, um, the, the guy who killed Putnam was the guy who killed Luke's partner, Joe Werner, and he did it about three or four days later. It, was, it all happened within the space of 10 days. Yeah, Dark Chuck the Merciless says Eclipse is postponed due to Chaikoms and uh, Persians wanting to schedule their plans to destroy the U.S. Um, I found out that uh, Bird is still planning to go to um, Air Venture, but Dick is not going to be able to make it. He's feeling rather ill. And when I heard that Dick wasn't going to be able to go, I just sent a group email back to everybody and said, uh, reschedule Air Venture, you know? I mean, can't have Air Venture without Dick Rutan there. It's not Air Venture. Um, so I, I so I put Putnam in, and it didn't take a, it didn't take a lot out of it in terms of diversion. Um, but it was a it was a tough decision, but I finally just felt you know. The, the whole purpose of this experiment, the experiment is, is it possible to tell? And I've been aware of this from the beginning. That's why I wanted to do it. Is it possible to tell? the story of a historical figure and make it a compelling movie and at the same time be as accurate as is possible to be? And I think the answer is yes. Um, we don't have to meet him. He was at, a, he was at a, so the 94th, which was Rickenbacker Squadron, and the 27th, which was Luke Squadron, plus the 95th, and I want to say the 137th, were um, all at the same field. They were part of the first pursuit group. Putnam was flying for the second pursuit group, which means he wasn't at the field, which is why I'd never heard of him, which is why I didn't have to deal with him, but I do get his name mentioned. Um, and 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 this and, and see the, the thing that really is starting to dawn on me now that this thing is really, really wrapping up is that you could all you could make a pretty good case that that Frank Luke's tragic flaw is the same as America's tragic flaw. It's not overconfidence because he he lived up to what he said he was going to do he he was he was as competent as he thought he was and it wasn't just the bragging because bragging is unpleasant and Americans can be pretty boorish about that kind of thing when we want to be Luke's tragic flaw was that he simply could not submit to authority, but really, ultimately, he just wanted to have things his own way. He just was too proud. Now, it turns out um, that uh, Luke, see, this is all why this whole thing has got this kind of cosmic kind of a, of, a, of a symmetry to it. Because when I was doing the, the, Mark, uh, the Mike Rowe podcast, Mike had mentioned these two Greek terms that I'd never heard before. Um, and I don't remember what they are, but he was talking about the tragic flaw that a character has in, in Greek literature. And there's also a term he used, and, and I hadn't heard about it, but the second I heard about it, I said, this is, this is the plot point that I need to wrap this movie up. Mike said that, that in, in, tragic, in Greek tragedy, in the, in the classical Greek tragedy, there's a moment where the, where the, the, um, the tragic hero has always had a tragic flaw. And there's a moment before the end of this, before this character dies, that he realizes what it is. That he realizes what it is. And a lot of people are checking, checking in with hubris, and the answer is very, I think it's close to that, but I don't think it's quite right. So I've got Frank Luke, who's, who from the very first frame to the last frame is a devout Catholic. So this is how the writing process works for me. He's got his friend Jerry Vasconcells who's trying to talk him into going back to the base. This is his final day alive, final hour alive, really. Go back to the base, face the music. You can't be court-martialed. He's not going to court-martial you. You just have to submit to the authority of this man that you don't like. You just have to submit to it. Go back, you know, take your medicine, 
you know, he's going to ground you. He's not going to arrest you. He says he's going to arrest you, but he's not going to arrest you. You're the, you're the ace of aces. He can't. What, what, what is he going to say? He was too aggressive. He wanted to shoot down too many Germans. It's not like he was drinking. So what does he do? Luke decides he cannot take any to this guy. And so when this guy, Jerry Vasconcelos, is trying to talk him out of going on this final mission, he has to go on this mission because the only way he can go back to base, he thinks, is to come back to base with a bunch of burning balloons. But that's because Frank couldn't face the fact that what he had to do was he had to go back to, to, to in order to go back to the base, he had to take a knee. And Vasconcel says, you're a Catholic, Frank, right? Yes. Well, you know what's interesting about you, Frank Luke? What's that? There are seven deadly sins, and you've only got one of them. And all of the rest of them, you're completely free of. There's only one, seven of the seven deadly sins that you have, and you've got it enough to make up for the other six. Pride, 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 it's pride. It's pride, Frank. That's why you can't go back. It's not because you have to go back with a win. It's not because you can't take the fact that this guy who's a small-minded martinet, who's, who's nothing like your natural talent, it's, it's you, you know, I, it's not going to say this, obviously, but he's like, he's Salieri. He's like, I will not acknowledge, oh, he's more like Mozart, I will not acknowledge that I have to work for this Salieri character who has no talent. I'm a genius and he's not, and I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. Fire Waco said it earlier, I guess I missed it, but it's pride, pride, pride. And to bring, to be able to bring the, the seven deadly sins into this Catholic boy's life at the last hour of his life and have him realize that he has a choice now. He has a choice. Before he takes off, his choice is you can either go out there and die on this mission, because he, he's pretty sure he's going to die on this mission. It's just he, he, There's no way to lay, maintain the level of risk that Luke was taking. And he kept taking that risk because he kept having to stay ahead of the consequences of his pride. And Vasconcelos, who's kind of turned into a really great character, just a really good guy, after his best friend's been killed, and, and, and he says, Frank, you don't have to go. You don't have to go out there and die for this. All you have to do is just go back to base and salute and say, yes, sir. That's it. That's all you have to do. Luke doesn't mind taking a knee to Hartney because Hartney's an ace and Hartney's flown top cover for him and Hartney understands him. He doesn't mind taking orders from Rickenbacker because Rickenbacker's an ace and he's a great guy and Luke likes Rickenbacker and respects him and Rickenbacker likes and respects Luke. Grant represents everything that Luke is against. He represents all of this tedious paperwork, red tape, mindless calisthenics at 5.30 in the morning from dead exhausted pilots. He represents his own arrow go, arrogant. What, what Grant represents is the stupidity of bureaucracy. He represents the fact that some people with zero ability rise to power over people with tremendous ability because of the way the machine is built. And he can't stand it. And he realizes that he would rather he would rather die than take a knee to, to this guy who he not only despises, it doesn't matter whether he despised him or not, he doesn't respect him. He hates the whole system. I've got a scene that I like an awful lot. Two scenes that I like an awful lot. Um, so, I have here, yeah. So here's the stand. Okay. Special artwork. Let's see if I can get it away from the reflections as much as possible. Special artwork commissioned by Stephen Skinner about Frank Luke after he's been shot down. He's been shot through the lungs. He's only got a few minutes to live. But he ends up he ends up getting out of his plane and taking on this German patrol that's coming after him. This is the stand. This is why Frank Luke was famous in the in the version that came out of the world out of World War One. He's shot down. And, he, and he's fine, and he lands his plane, and he basically jumps out of the plane, and his German patrol is coming for him, and he says, you'll never take me a line, you filthy hun bastards, or something to that effect. Pulls out his, his 45, and boom, 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 boom. Seven Germans lie dead, then finally he's shot to death on the ground. It's, it's, it's Luke's last stand. That's how I heard the story of Frank Luke. Well, it's not how it happened, but... Um, this... 
moment is pivotal because of are you ready for this it's pivotal moment because of the weapon and the weapon is a 45 caliber automatic 1911 Colt that's what is the center of the movie that's the mythical center of the movie is the is that sidearm that's why when I wrote the Frank Luke section for America's Forgotten Heroes I really like the titles of those one of them was um, John Paul Jones sails home from the war uh, uh, Jimmy Doolittle releases the brakes Ernest Evans orders hard left full rudder it was a it's a nice way to uh, um, Booker T. Washington takes the last train home it was a nice way to capture kind of the thing being in motion and for the Frank Luke story it was Frank Luke um, unholsters his sidearm now As it turns out, this is what research will do if you really... I will say this about this. I don't know whether the story's going to be any good. I have a good feeling about it, but it, it, whether it's any good or not, I can, I can say there's one thing that this script is not, and, it's, and that is it's not a lazy script. The, the amount of work I've done on this, the amount of research and, and depth is, is really quite amazing. So it's not lazy. So here are some of the things that I learned, and you don't realize in, in script writing, you don't know where these pieces are going to fit. You just go after the information and you remember it and then it comes to you so here's some of the things that I knew I knew that Frank Luke used to go out camping I knew that he and his friend Bill Elders who had scoliosis who was kind of a runt no other word for him this runt and this football star would go out and they'd ride their horses 120 miles from Phoenix out to Fort Apache out on the Indian Reservation they'd fish the San Carlos River I knew that he had shot down this um, as a boy shot this pennant that the seniors had, had put up on the flagpole he was a junior and they were having a big old rumble just a big nasty brawl sanctioned brawl to get it to the top so I knew that so I knew he had to shoot at that with something and then in a corner of the research that I was doing for him on his family I found out that his father had an uncle and that his father's uncle had served in, the, in California during the Civil War and had always wanted glory, military glory, but he never got it. And, and that his father's uncle, Charlie Luke, had then, after the war, gotten a job as a guide and he was bringing Easterners out to Arizona Territory. His dad is telling him the stories because Frank has been using his his the gun that Frank's been using prior to this hunting trip has been a Colt Navy revolver. Now that's what that was the sidearm of the people used in the Civil War. It's sort of the predecessor. I'm not a gun expert by any means, but it's kind of the predecessor of the Colt six shooter that you see in all the westerns. The Colt Navy revolver was a Civil War weapon, but it was also um, you know a revolver big deal at the time when you were individually loading muskets and things like that so he's got this Colt Navy revolver they find shells from a Colt Navy revolver at the base of this flagpole but they never see Frank shooting the weapon and Frank's got his horse packed and his friend is on his way and they're getting ready to go out on this you know 120 mile ride for four or five days and um, and Frank says oh, Okay, Dad, I'm all set. I guess the only thing I'm waiting for now is the uh, if I can just borrow the Navy, the Colt Navy. And and his father says, I'm, I'm not I'm not giving you the Colt Navy, Frank. Frank is like, Dad, we've been planning. He said, Pop, Pop, we've been planning this trip for months, Bill and I. You know, he says, Well, you've got your 22 rifle. He says, Pop, we're going out to Indian country. You know. If, if we run into some Apaches and shoot at him with a twenty two, he's just going to make him angry. And his father says, you arguing with me, Frank? And he says, no, sir. No, sir, I'm not. So then Frank's father tells Frank the story of his, meaning Frank's father's uncle. He says, so your uncle, Charlie, was uh, after glory, and, um, and he was hired as a guide, and he was bringing a group of Easterners out to... Um, 
Arizona, people who didn't know a dog from a donkey, he says. And, um, and they were ambushed by Indians. I forget the name of the tribe, but he says the tribe. Then his Frank's father says, Frank's sitting on a horse. Frank's father says, uh, now there's no shame in being ambushed. But when, we, when that group was ambushed, my father's brother ran away so fast, he cut, he cut his saddle off his horse, just took off out of there. He left a boy behind who was running with him. He just left him behind, jumped on the horse, cut the saddle off because it wasn't fully, you know, rigged, outfitted or whatever the correct word is, and he just ran. And Frank says, oh my God, Dad. He says, yeah, they called it the Luke Massacre. And here's a quote, this is what they wrote about it. You know what they wrote about my uncle, Charlie, Frank? No, I didn't. no, Pop, what they write? He said, it's the, this stands out as the single example of raw cowardice in the history of Maricopa County. And these are the Lukes. And his father says, I'm not giving you the Colt. I've let you use it till now because you, you weren't old enough to understand the story of this gun till now. But that's a coward's gun. And I'm not going to have my brave son going anywhere with a coward's gun. You're not going out there with a coward's gun, Frank. And then he's, then his wife has been holding this basket with a cover on it. Luke is sure there's like chicken in there or sandwiches or something like that. So then Mrs. Luke says, we've been trying, your father and I have been trying to figure out what kind of present we could get for our um, state champion fullback son who's been a, a really good boy and is going to be a good man someday so she hands him the covered basket and he opens it up and he pulls out a rag clean rag and unfolds it and inside is a is a 1911 a1 45 caliber pistol he said that this is yours you're a brave boy and you're a brave man we're very proud of you and he looks at this thing and he just can't believe it he says, really? He says, yeah. He says, on one condition, Frank. He says, you don't ever run away from a fight, ever. Frank says, I'm not a coward, Dad. He says, I know you're not. I know you're not. But you don't ever run away from a fight. He says, I'll die before I run away from a fight. And then Bill rides up, and he says, Bill, can you believe this? Look at this. This is my mom and pop just got me. And, and Bill Elder says, that's the new Colt. Doesn't even really look like a gun. You've never seen it before. Semi-automatic, brand new. Frank knows what it is, puts the rounds in there, ranks it, racks it, clicks the safety on, hands it to, to Bill. He's got the safety right here, see? Dad says, you guys have a good time out there. You boys have a good time, he says. So they go riding off. I'll get to those super chats in a minute. Thank you for all of those that keep appearing. So Frank goes out camping, and he's just shooting the gun the whole time. He's only got seven rounds with him, so he's, you know, maybe 14 or whatever. But he's like, you know, four rounds left to go, target practice, you know, three, two. He's got one round left in the gun. He says, puts the safety on. They're riding home. It's dark. They can see the city lights of, of Phoenix. They're coming back down from four days up in the camping up in the Superstition Mountains. And he hands the gun to his best friend, Bill. And he says, one round left, Bill. It's all yours. Hand, puts the safety on, hands it over to him, and Bill says, uh, geez, Frank, I don't know, aren't you supposed to keep one round for yourself in case you get ambushed by Indians or something? And Frank says, uh, Bill, if I ever get ambushed by Indians, then they're going to get the whole magazine. I like that line a lot. That just That's a Frank Luke thing to say. So this is his weapon, and then he gets into the army, and he's got this rebelliousness from the beginning. He's got rebelliousness about being split up with his other friend. He's just constantly talking back. He just refuses to do um, any of this BS paperwork. But really near the end of the movie, when he's having an argument with Werner, when Werner's trying to say to him, Frank, you've got to, you can't be this so insubordinate. It's not helping you. It's not helping me. Grant gave us approval for this mission, and you and you just decided not to come back that night because you don't like him. It's stupid, Frank. Don't be stupid. Don't be an idiot. He says, let me tell you a story about the Army. We're in a, uh, for a Joe. He's ex Luke is, this is Luke trying to explain why he can't stand this Army stuff so much. So, so Luke reaches down. It's just the two of them. They're in the barracks, and it's 
early morning, there's nobody else there, and he says, let me, let me tell you what the U.S., here, here's what the Army is, uh, Joe. So he reaches into his holster, pulls out a 45, un drops the magazine, racks the round out of the chamber, hands it to him, to Werner, and he says, rack it. These guys are having their only argument in the whole story. Rack it. He says, okay, so what? He says, rack it again. What? He said, just keep racking it. Keep racking it. Just keep doing it, Joe. Just do it. You feel that? You feel that wobble in there? You feel that? He looked down the barrel. He says, I'm not looking down the barrel of the 45, Frank. I don't care whether it's loaded or not. It's suicidal enough flying with you in the first place. He says, look down the barrel. Look, it doesn't matter whether you look down the barrel or not, Joe. The gun is shot out, okay? It's shot out. There's no rifling left on this pistol. It's gone. They fired thousands of rounds through this thing. It's useless. How useless is it? Well, let me tell you. I decided when they issued me this, I decided I was going to sit down and clean this weapon. Not armory clean it, really clean it. And I found some stuff at the back of the, um, of the spring mechanism. And I thought it was just dried oil. But then I realized, you know what? Dried oil doesn't turn red when you clean it off with kerosene. And, and Warren goes, oh, God. He goes, yeah, oh, God is right. This gun was in the hands of the guy who had it before me when he was killed. And he was probably killed since he's holding the gun. There's no other explanation for it, Joe. He's probably killed trying to shoot at somebody who's coming at him, and the gun is not going to hit this guy because the rifling's no good in the gun. He says, that's not the army, uh, Joe. Here's the army. Back home, I have an identical gun to this. It's identical in every way. I spent 100 hours dialing in those sights, pulling a little bit off of the trigger pull. I spent 100 hours getting that gun exactly the way it needs to be. It's a beautiful weapon. It's a powerful weapon. It's a lethal weapon. And the Army won't let me have that weapon that belongs at the end of my arm because of paperwork. So now I have to carry this dead man's gun that's worthless instead of the gun that I didn't say the line twice, instead of the gun that belongs at the end of my arm. That's the army. And he's right. But he's also wrong. That's the way he sees things, you know? Why can't I bring my perfectly balanced, beautiful, new, 1911 a1 45 caliber pistol instead of being issued this exact same weapon except it's a piece of shit because it's been shot out for for the last two years why 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 he just wants to know there's there is no why there's no why he and his friend um woody woodard trained together flew together they spent six months together they finally get assigned to a combat squadron they know each other grew up together kind of not to grow up together went to school together knew his fiance and all of it and they meet another couple of guys, Archibald and Beauchamp, and they trained and, and flew together. So the four of them are heading to their squadron assignments finally after, after uh, you know, having been doing nothing but ferry flights. They're finally getting in the war. And, um, and they're saying, this is great. We get to, we get to stay together. Frank, and, Frank and, um, and Woodard train together and Archibald and Beauchamp train together. So at least we're going to have pals. Hopefully we'll end up all in the same squadron, but if we don't, because they just met each other, the twos and the twos. So they get to their forward base, and they sit there, and they get their assignments, and it's, it's Woodard and Archibald and Luke and Beauchamp. They split the friends up. And Luke says, no, no, hold on. This is, this is, this is dumb. I've trained with Woody the whole time. We know each other. We're wingmen. This is a, we are, this is a combat asset. Sir, he's talking to the lieutenant who's the adjutant. And the adjutant says, I don't care. He says, but this doesn't make any sense. Can't you just switch the names? I mean, how hard is it to switch the names? We don't care which squadron we go to. Just want to stay together, just switch the names. And this guy, a real guy named Dupoy, says, I can't switch the names because I've already submitted the paperwork. And Luke says, well, I'm going to fight this. He says, oh, please do. I think I mentioned this part earlier. Please do. Have your, have your complaint on my desk at 0600 tomorrow morning sharp, at which point it will be forwarded to the adjutant of the 27th squadron, which would be me. Have your reports and, and in triplicate. 
on my desk by 0600 tomorrow morning. It'll be opened by me. I will retain a copy. I will then pass it up to Major Atkinson at first group. His adjutant will open it. He'll retain a copy. He'll ten send that up to the commander of the, of the air group, who will then send it up to Billy Mitchell. I'm paraphrasing because he goes on and on. Who will then send it up to Black Jack Pershing, who will then wire for instructions from President uh, Wilson. Wilson will call a private session of Congress to get Senate approval for you changing your name on this entire sequence of things that has to be voided just because you want to hang out with your pals. And he's right. So when you get into these things, you, you get both sides of the story. They're both right. They're both right. So, you know, so then when, so when finally at the end of this movie, when Frank is in his final moments on this earth and he's lying there in the mud and he manages to get to his feet, he, he went, he, the, the, the legend of Luke was his last stand, you know, kind of Custer, Custer, last stand. That's the way Americans go down. Not going to take me alive. That's the whole story that Frank Luke, of Frank Luke, that spun out of World War I as a result of this over-idealization of, of, of the of over-accuracy. And to me, I don't know if Steve Skinner felt the same way, but to me, the stand is more literal than that. It's not that he's making a last stand. It's that he's standing up. He's been shot through both lungs. Every breath he takes is increasing the pressure on his lungs as, as, his, as his body cavity fills with blood. It gets harder and harder to breathe. He can barely see he's so oxygen deprived. He's in incredible pain, needless to say. He's lying face down in the mud. The easy thing to do is just to lie down, stay in the mud, and just roll over and just close your eyes. But he doesn't. Is it because he has made a promise to his dad? I, I could not have written that story about his uncle. I couldn't have written it better than the truth. I would never have had the imagination to do it. And even if I had, people would have said, oh, that's, that's not, there's no way that's possible. It's a nice dramatic device, but come on. That's exactly what happened. His, his, his father's uncle was a coward. And Frank had been using a coward's gun. And now, Frank, here is a new gun for you, because you're not a coward. And I'll give you the gun, the shiny new toy, if you promise that you're never going to run away from a fight. Is that what he was thinking of when he got out of the mud? Because he did get out of the mud. Now, I don't know for a fact that his father gave him a 45. That's an invention of mine. But the fact that his, that his father's uncle was a coward and the Luke massacre and all the rest of it, that's all true. And this is what the, uh, the process of writing historical drama consists of. I know that he shot up a flagpole with something as a boy. I know that he used to go out camping. I know that his father's brother was a coward and was in the Civil War. And I made up all the rest. But I don't I don't know if it's true, and it's not a question of fake but accurate, but it could have happened, and it should have happened. Um, and this business of, of that line, once I, once, once Mike had mentioned that term that the, that, that, that the Greeks realized that there has to be a moment in this drama when the fatally flawed character, when the tragic hero realizes that he's got this fatal flaw he has to realize it he can't just have it he has to know he's got it and once he said that i thought oh man and then i thought so what is his fatal flaw when he get right down to it i thought well hubris then i thought wait a minute hold on he's a catholic what's the what are the seven deadly sins and uh you know pride gluttony lust uh sloth greed um uh, missing one or two um wrath even his wrath, he gets angry in a fight, but he, he doesn't get angry in a fight, actually. He's kind of just, I wish I didn't have to do this. He's got none, he's got zero of the, of the seven deadly sins, except for one. And the one he's got, he's got seven times. And so there comes a time when he hangs up the phone and he has to sit there for just a minute with himself. He's off the phone with Baskin Cells. He's been, he's been offered a way out. All you have to do is go back, salute 
you're going to get some discipline. You'll get grounded for a couple days. There'll be some disciplinary action. And you have to let Major Grant have his way over you. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to go to jail. You don't have to do anything. You can keep flying. You can keep ring, ringing up your score. You can do all of the things you want to do. And Luke has to sit there for a moment and realize, not only can I go back, but I can go back and I can fly with Eddie Rickenbacker. I can get out of Major Grant's squadron. I can go back and, and, and deal with all of these things. But that would mean taking a knee. And I'm not taking a knee. I'm just not going to do it. I'd rather die. Um, Eric says, if you can shoot that gun with one hand, have him hold the rosary in the other hand, the last stand of him firing with the power of God on his side. It's an interesting thought, actually. That's something to think about. It's a, I have to give that some thought. That That's possible. It's a good idea. As usual, I get great ideas from you, Eric. I have to think that one over. But I knew from the beginning what the last scene in the movie was going to be, the last shot, the last visual in the movie, the very, very last thing after we wrap up all these stories. You know, what happened to this guy, what happened to that guy, the epilogue kind of thing. And there was a story about a guy who was not part of Frank's crew. I may, this is the kind of thing that I may do. There was a guy who was a mechanic who didn't work on Frank's plane, but he spends a lot of time with the mechanics that did. And I may transfer this story from the guy who didn't work on Frank's plane to the mechanic who did. That's just consolidation of a minor character, and uh, it makes a lot more. It's just cleaner that way. But the one thing that I that I liked the most when I decided to do the Frank Luke originally for um, America's Forgotten Heroes, I, I knew I wanted this to be the final passage in the book. There was a guy who was a mechanic who was just on the field, and he says, I was just never knew Frank particularly well or anything. But I was walking along the road, heading to town one day, and Frank Luke was coming back to the base and he was on a motorcycle. And he was riding along between these beautiful French countryside road with these beautiful elm trees everywhere. And the guy said, um, Frank, uh, Frank Luke pulled out two forty fives, took his hands off the handlebars, pulled out two forty fives, and with one in each hand, he went rolling down this road and just <laughs> <laughs> shooting at these elm trees. And the guy telling the story is, says, and he hit every one of them. That's pretty good. And then that, that last image is going to be this blonde American fullback sports star hero, the greatest fighter pilot who was in World War I, without question, in terms of ability. And he's riding this motorcycle. <laughs> And time just slows down. It doesn't just go to slow-mo. It doesn't cut to slow-mo. Time just slows down. And just as he gets to the final position, he pulls the trigger, and this flash comes out of the gun, and it stops. And that's the end of the movie. That's pretty cool. I'm pretty pretty happy with it. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a mountain of work that's virtually off my shoulders, and then we're going to have some fun, all of us together. Uh, <laughs> as Effendi says, two forty five. Well, that's a ninety. Yes, it's exactly right. He's in. It's a ninety. Um, let me get to some of these super chats here that I that I rolled over while I was in the middle of this. Uh, one from. Um, McGillis, I think. Thank you. Well, shameful injustice sent me on my path of conservatism. Thank you. Well, that's been a while since I heard that one. Not the biggest, but the best voice. Still so much to learn. Thank you for all the work you've done. Hope it's been worth it. Well, thank you so much for that, McGillis. Uh, most shameful injustice was something I did for the David Horowitz Freedom Center um, back when they were doing Truth Revolt, which Jeremy and Ben were running. And there was a falling out between them and uh, David Horowitz and the board. And basically, they cut the video funding for Truth Revolt, so Jeremy and Ben started this little mom-and-pop organization called Daily Wire, which now owns the world. Um, but uh, the most shameful injustice, uh, David um, David uh, Shapiro, I'm sorry, David Horowitz gave me the, um, 
the research on that. It's about what happens in America's inner cities. And he insisted on calling it the most shameful injustice. I wanted to call it death by Democrat. Um, but uh, basically, that particular firewall was about what happens to the money that goes into educational system in this country and how how factually horrible American cities are for American blacks because they've been run by Democrats for 80 years, 90 years, without without a single Republican mayor, without a single Republican um, controlled, you know, city council. And just the the carnage and the and the and the callousness to find out that something like that changes somebody's opinion about about politics is um, is very flattering and and especially flattering because it's the entire reason I feel like I'm here. So thank you very much for the super chat, but the compliment is uh, is, is much more valuable to me, and I'm grateful for both. So thank you very much. Uh, we got uh, not the spectacles here. Uh, Lapco92 says, Hey, Bill, something bothered me the other week. Take a quick glance at the short passage, My Creed by Dean Alfonge, 1950. I choose not to be a common man. is not disparaging. It means that we as Americans are uncommon men. Yes, Frank Luke is an uncommon guy, too. Um, but at the same time, he is a common guy. That's the thing I like about Frank. There's a he's a complete outsider a lot of that's because he's such a braggart and he's responsible for so much of his own trouble but one of the scenes I have in the movie is where there's a new pilot comes in and Frank and, and Joe Werner sit in the corner one of them is a is a you know Herr Werner is the potential German spy and Luke is the loudmouth braggart coward yellow yellow haired yellow bellied Frank Luke and um, and these two guys are sitting there and they're both common men and this new pilot comes in, really happened, real real guy. I had to look him up. Um, and I was hoping he was from a good university, and he was. So um, so this new guy arrives, and he's from Auburn, and he went to the right fraternities as the rest of some of these snotty guys who were given Luke and, and Werner so much trouble. And they're saying, oh, so you're not only educated, you're an educated gentleman. You're a general, you're a gentleman aviator, like like the rest of us here, with certain exceptions. It's amazing what kind of, you know, shit kicking cowboys they're letting into this group of, of educated sportsmen. Uh, I have one character named Dawson who starts off hating Luke along with the rest of the antique Luke clique, but he's on a mission with Luke, sees what Luke does with his own eyes. And when the anti-Luke clique continues to be anti-Luke, he just folds his, literally folds his cards. They're playing cards. And he says, all right, I'm leaving. What's the matter with you? We all thought that Luke was yellow. He's not. And I thought you were a better man than that, Ken. I thought you, you know, I thought you were a sportsman. Uh, but sportsmen are not afraid to admit when they're wrong. And, uh, and I was wrong about Frank Luke, and you're wrong about him, too. And um, I don't want to be any part of this anymore. So he changes sides because he, he changes his mind because he saw the evidence. Luke went in on this balloon and made six passes. Six. Most guys didn't want to make one. And um, three of those passes, he was below the balloon. His wheels were practically bouncing off the, the, the grass. He just wouldn't give up. He wouldn't give up till he got the balloon. Um, so that's a that's an uncommon man, and at the same time, I mean, what is he? He's not. He's not. He's he's a he's a kid from Phoenix. He he goes camping. He go, rides horses, and, and and he plays football. And he's you know, he's talented, but he's not pedigreed. He's um he gets there on merit. And combination of that and and Werner. I've come to love I've come to love Joe Werner who you should see um, another loner just like Frank flew top cover for Frank you never heard of Frank Luke without Werner um, I get to write for Billy Mitchell yeah here's Eddie and here's Major Hartney so that's I'm sorry about the lighting. 
That's uh, Fast Eddie Rickenbacker. He's always got that kind of confident grin. Here's Major Hartney. Canadian guy who saw the potential in Frank and took him under his wing and kept basically covering for him. Uh, but Werner is the heart of this movie because Luke has his tragic flaws. Werner's tragic flaw is that, is that he... He's just too good a man. He never complains. He, he just... He's just a good guy. He's just a good man, good, quiet guy. He gets constantly abused the day before, the day he dies in combat. I've got him eating alone as he usually did in the, in the mess tent, and these two guys who had been on the fence came in and apologized to him. And just the fact that they want to sit down and have breakfast with him makes him like happy for the first time he's, since he's been there. He's been, he's been called a traitor. He's been called all these other things. And finally, these two guys say, we were wrong about you, Joe. And we're sorry, and we wanted to apologize. He says, well, thanks. Very nice of you guys. You never did me any harm. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Um, then he says, did you just come over to tell me that? Or are you going to stay for breakfast? I said, well, we'd like to stay if you'll have us. He says, sounds great. And then the way that men do, one of them takes a, um, his eggs in a spoon and just pours the eggs out and this yellow liquid just runs out of this spoon and um, and one of these two pilots that came to apologize says that poor chicken and Warner says yep yeah I saw that chicken when I was in town last time smoking cigarettes drinking too much hanging around with roosters of ill repute and the other guys laugh and um, and he laughs and he has that moment, one moment where he connects with, where he's, where he's no longer an outsider. He has that one breakfast where he's part of the squadron and he's accepted and he says, my luck is changing. And then he goes up and he gets killed. Tommy Lennon, Hoover, I know, I know these guys. I feel like I grew up with them. Let me find Warner because the picture of Warner, there's one picture of Warner that um, is really just says it all. Just have to find it. Oh, here's Grant. Grant is the um, is the martinet. He's the the by the books guy. Perfect, right? You can't make this stuff up. But Joe, here he is. Here's poor tragic Joe, Joe Warner. It's a good face. It's a good face. He was a good man. He became an ace on his last mission. He got two balloons on his last mission before he was killed. He was killed by the guy who killed Putnam. <sighs> Life. Um, yep. Uh, now, uh, Selena Guerrero says, uh, 69 says, Hollywood is dying. It is. I didn't, every year that goes by, I'm, the amount of time it takes for me to realize that the Oscars have come and, lo and gone gets longer and longer and longer. It's like, um, oh, the Oscars were Sunday night? I had no idea and I don't care. Yep. <laughs> Excuse me. Who won? Oh, it turns out Oppenheimer did. Okay, great x-rated movie about a I didn't even see it I wanted to but I just I didn't I wanted to see Napoleon and I didn't because they just looked looking ahead to him I thought these would be great but they just don't interest me anymore um, but Hollywood is dead and gone nobody gives a damn about these people I, every time I see them now I just plain I just plain 
They fill me with nothing but contempt and a vague kind of disgust, including Tom Hanks, you know. In fact, almost especially Tom Hanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I heard it was good, but I just heard there was just all this, you know, all of these kind of like passionate lovemaking scenes in, in Oppenheimer, I guess, no one's trying to prove that the guy was an actual human being, okay? Oh, wow, Lady Jane Waterman saw it four times in theaters. So maybe I should go. I did like the effect of the bomb, and I do like historical drama, so it's on my list of things. I'll, I'll probably watch it when it's, it's already streaming, so I'll take a look at it. Godzilla Minus One got effects Oscar, I heard. Certainly deserved it. I heard that was great. That's something I haven't had a chance to do either, but um, but everybody's just raving about it. And I thought it was very, very clever and brilliant decision to set that Godzilla movie in the 50s and not modern day. So anyway. Um, all right, so why don't we do some questions here? But um, this thing is coming to an end, and, uh, and I'm, I don't know what's going to happen to it. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. I'm going to get that thing made one way or another. It's not a hard film to make, by the way. I did Frank Luke because I thought it was the simplest of the ones that I'd done. I mean, ultimately, you've got the, your sets are barracks and tents and fields, open fields, wood hangers. There are um, there are a number of flying spad replicas that the, those guys would be nothing but delighted to um, to you know have on camera and uh, you know. It's not a huge cast. There's no giant extras. It's not shot in forests. You don't have to go to, you know, Hungary like they did with uh, Pendragon Cycle. Oh, Jeremy told me a story about that what that was kind of interesting, which I'm pretty sure I can share here. Hang on a second. So um, I got a chance to talk with Jeremy Boring just for about half an hour over the weekend for the first time really since he'd been back. Told him I'd written another, his favorite his favorite show ever of all time is Lonesome Dove and it's a four part miniseries. I said, that's what came out, man. I, I know the rabbit hole it went into, but this is the one that it came out of. So I don't know what to tell you. Um, but he was telling me about shooting Pendra Pendragon and um, and I've heard this from other producers as well, uh, and that's got to do with shooting when American crews go overseas to shoot. I find it personally kind of flattering, not to me personally, I mean to the country. Um, here are the questions. Thank you, Roadrunner, for curating these. Okay, so um, I'll get those questions in a second. Let me tell you the story real quick. So uh, Jeremy was talking about... Um, shooting the pen dragon cycle and it was well you know sometimes it's a slog and it's always a slog shooting a movie is is very much like going to war just just the supply lines alone on a foreign location or any kind of a remote location just that alone is horrific and so they're they're often slogs and they're the ones that are really bad we call death marches he didn't call it a death march i did i said it sounds like it might have been a death march but um, he was talking about working overseas in Hungary. And he said, um, he knows his business, that boy. He said, you know, in America, you get a, when you hire somebody for a film, you, you get a 10-hour day. And, um, and after 10 hours, it goes to golden time, which is double time, I think. And I think you might get another two hours at double time. And then after that, it goes to triple time. So if you're making, you know, 100 bucks an hour, and then you're suddenly after 10 hours, you're making 200 bucks an hour. And after 12 hours, you're making 300 bucks an hour. So American crews are not only more tolerant of working overtime, Jeremy said a lot of these guys who sign up for movies are counting on it. 
it's part of their salary calculations on whether or not they can afford to do the movie. If you take away their, if you if you run the thing so much on schedule that there's no overtime or double time or triple time, then they're actually angry because they were counting on it. So, but you go to Hungary, you get a film crew for 10 hours and that's a flat rate. And after 10 hours, if you ask them to work more than 10 hours, they'll start crying. And they'll not only start crying, he said, they'll start cursing and, and, and wailing, and putting on a big show. We're not slaves. We're not your servants. We're not slaves. We're professionals. You cannot treat us like animals. Okay, man, you know, we need another hour. We need 11 hours out of you guys. Can we get it? No. All right, then I guess we don't get it. I talked to somebody I, I never knew very well, just started up a conversation with this woman who was a producer on a film that they shot in Egypt out at the pyramids. She said, told me three things about that, that um, David Booty says, but do the Euro film crews loaf and goof off like American crews? I don't know what your experience has been, Dave, but I've never seen an American film crew goofing off. That those those people, that there's no there's no slack in there. Though that to me has always been the the hardest working group of people I've ever seen as a movie shoot. Anyway, in Egypt, this woman said, um, so they would go there, and she had an, a driver that was supplied by the local production company that they were working with. So it was an American production shooting in Egypt with a largely Egyptian crew. <laughs> And so, so she was the producer, and she was assigned a driver. And it makes sense for it to be the same driver the whole time because you get to know each other and know where you're going and all the rest of it. So she would say, all right, um, you know, um, let's just say Mohammed because that's the most common name. Okay, Mohammed. so tomorrow morning, uh, 7 o'clock call, so I need you here at the hotel in the car ready to go at 6.30 in the morning. And Mohammed would say, I will be here at 6.30 tomorrow morning, inshallah. And inshallah means uh, if God wills it. And she, and she would say, um, not 6.30 in the morning, inshallah, 6.30 in the morning, period. And she explained to me that if it turned out that they would, she said they weren't that they were lazy or anything, or, or they weren't taking advantage of it. It's just the mindset. She would say, if, if, for instance, I needed the car at 6 o'clock and he didn't get there till 8.30 because he overslept, it wasn't his fault. That was God's will that, that he overslept. Um, Lady Jane's got a question about uh, Empire of Terror that I will get to in just a minute before I get to our written questions because it's a long one and I'd like to talk about that for a second. Anyway, she said that, the, um, that, the, uh, that this was endemic to the entire crew. We'll be there tomorrow, God willing. I can't count on God willing. I need to count on we will be there. Meaning, if you can't be there because a meteorite strikes your house and God's will really is in play, then you've got a backup who's going to be there. That's how this stuff works. We cannot, we've got 200 people that are going to be there. It's costing us a million dollars tomorrow. We cannot have inshallah. We have to have it there. This is very American. Um, the, the people I've heard of that work in European crews, French crews, same thing. Once you get past 10 hours, it just, they just stop. They just walk off the set. It's like, we're not going to be, we're not going to be, um, your slaves or your animals. It's like, guys, you're working in show business. The fact that you're working in show business, that you're not working in mines or factories or, or insurance agencies or the rest of it, you should be a little grateful about that. But she said, that was one thing she said, but the two things that I could never get over were, uh, were this, um, there's a funny one and another one that wasn't funny. It was just baffling. She said the funny one was we were out in the pyramids and it was honest to God 115 degrees out there. And there were local vendors trying to make American money by selling, you know, refreshments to the crew, which is a smart idea and capitalism at its finest. I said, that sounds great. She said, yes. I said, but what wasn't great was the refreshments that they were selling to the American crew was hot tea. And uh, I said, you're kidding. She goes, nope, that's what they drink in, in Egypt when it's hot. They drink hot tea. And uh, I said, okay. And, and she said, you guys could make a lot more money because you're working hard. They were getting out there first thing in the morning and keeping everybody supplied and stuff. But she said, if you want to increase the amount of money you make by a factor of 20 or 30 or 50, 
instead of selling hot tea, maybe you should sell cold Coke. And they said, but we don't do Coke, we do hot tea. That's what we serve. And, and she couldn't get through. And that's, um, that's one of the things that American exceptionalism is about. It's like, adapt, you know, adapt. We're in this, we're not in it for the money, we're in it for the result. We're getting paid and it costs money to get this, but we are artists, you know. We believe in this project, or at least we, at least we pretend to when we signed on. And she said they couldn't get it. And she said the one thing that was the, the weirdest and the most incon impenetrable to us was that there, for, for those of you unfamiliar with how the movie works, there's are, things are called call sheets. And call sheets are basically put together by production managers and every day they're issued and they're distributed to the cast and the crew and they basically tell you this is what we're going to be doing tomorrow, this is the location and this is the time you need to be there. Can't run a movie without a call sheet. So when they did the thing in Egypt they had call sheets but they wouldn't put the date on them. I said they what? They said they wouldn't put the date on them. I said how hard is it to put the date on it? She said this is the question I asked but they didn't. So we could never tell whether the call sheet that we're holding on to was today's call sheet for tomorrow or whether it was from last week or, or we, we never ever found out. It caused absolute chaos. We kept asking them, can you just put the date on the top? They said, well, we don't put the date on the top of call sheets. We just make a new one every day. What do you say to that? So um, it, it's just, I don't know if part of this might be, undoubtedly part of it is just resistance to Americans coming over. But, you know, we're not running a, a iPhone factory here, guys. You know, we're making a movie. We're hiring you and we're paying good money at American rates in many cases for this. And we expect, since you're going to get paid well, and since you claim to be artists in terms of being directors of photography and sound guys, and we expect that you're going to have some commitment to the project because we're paying you to do that. No, nope, doesn't happen doesn't happen over there so um, he said that was enormously frustrating I said well whoever edited your uh, your weekly journal updates did a great job because you guys look like you're having a blast said, oh, it was rough man it was really it was really pretty tough um, so anyway that was uh, that was that let me go back to this uh, question that I saw here about Empire of Terror. Uh, let me re recap if I, I mentioned this uh, last time and I'll keep mentioning it. Here's what's basically happening with um, uh, BillWhittle.com and uh, Daily Wire and stuff. We had a approval for a 30-day free membership in Daily Wire. Um, I, last time I'd called it a trial membership, but it's not because somebody said that's not a good advertising term. It's a limited time 30-day free membership to Daily Wire and that would be plenty of time for anybody who's a member of BillWhittle.com to see um, Empire of Terror plus Cold War plus Apollo 11 plus listen to um, America's Forgotten Heroes all the stuff that I've taken time to do over there they gave me gave me 30-day free membership and she said, we'll give you a code, and you can just enter that code, so um, we'll start it tomorrow. I said, can you hold on to that, Dana, for just a, another week or two? The free membership is for 30, it lasts for 30 days, but it's only active for 30 days. So the, it's a 30-day it's a offer, and once that clock starts, then, um, then you got 30 days. And I asked her if she could hold on to it for a week or 10 days because I'm not ready for it yet. I have got to get this thing out the door and then I can and then I'm going to produce one episode of Story Mechanics, the first episode of Things to Come and an update on uh, Major Mace Mattingly and and then I'm going to start the clock. Um, and besides by then uh, we'll have had three or four episodes in the can because I want to make sure everybody gets to see them. There's eight episodes of Empire of Terror and if they're releasing them once a week then that really means you know you wouldn't get to see the last ones and stuff so I'm gonna hang on to it for a little while but it's coming and uh, when I um, when I uh, talked to their me their membership person about this I said this is really important to me it really 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 important to me 
Um, so I won't wait till they've all dropped. What I'll do is I'll wait until we've got three episodes left and we've got four weeks to see them, you know? Plenty of time to see everything else, plus time to see the final episode and have another week for people's schedules to sync up. And the nice thing about it is, is that doesn't just apply to BillWhittle.com members, it also applies to, I can offer it as a membership benefit for BillWhittle.com. Become a member at BillWhittle.com, you quit anytime you want to, we've got an unsubscribe button right there, easy to find, we're not one of these people that make you have to learn how to program computers in order to stop your subscription. And then, um, so you can drop that at any time, but you'll also get a chance to get 30 days free with Daily Wire. Let's see the work that we do over there, and we'll continue to be doing work with them over there. But it'll also give you a chance to see all the fun stuff we do over here and keep these messages coming and all the rest. So, um, so that's the plan. So it's coming. Um, Stress-free lounge would be good if the website was cleaned up in time for daily w w daily wire offer. Furball, it's not only good, it's essential. The nightmare, the nightmare that I had and have and had to, had to deal with because I have to do pretty much everything here myself largely. The nightmare is to have everything in place for a large promotion and then have the website not work. That's what happened to Star Citizen when they did it. Um, they uh, they were looking to raise, I don't know, $850,000 or something, and they ended up raising $6 million or something. But their website went down, you know, an hour into this release thing, and so many people are coming to the site and then bouncing off. Um, so we still have some work to do. It's it's most of the work we did was cosmetic, and 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 the, the the old website just was not working anymore. It just wasn't working. So we still have a bunch of stuff to do. Um, so anyway, there's that. So let's see what we got here. Uh, is that one question? There it is. Lady Janie Waterman, that's a cool name. My question is about Empire of Terror. I noticed that while you were inside a Lubyanka building with a whole camera crew, other locations had to be Google Earth. Can you talk about that a little? Was it hard to get into the Lubyanka? Was it harder to the to the Google Earth locations? Love, love, love your what we saws. Well, Lady Jane, Lady Janie Waterman, you have made my day, week, month, and year, and I will pass that comment on to the people who made it happen because we were never in the Lubyanka. Uh, that was a set that was built in um, Nashville, Tennessee, and everything behind me was a super high density LED wall. So that corridor that disappears in the background, including the flickering lights, was all 3D rendered, but it was physically present on the set. I wasn't keyed into it, and that means that the background could actually light me. Um, we do six of the eight episodes inside the basement of the Lubyanka, and then the final two, we go out into the gulags, and, and the, the set for the gulags is even more impressive. If you go to BillWhittle.com, by the way, um, the first thing you'll see when you get there is this rotating carousel of images, and the first two or three, like not the first picture, but the second one I think is Apollo 11. I think the third one and the fourth one are from Empire of Terror. So if you want to see what the um, gulag uh, set looks like, you can just go to BillWhittle.com and you get a nice big picture of it. I think it's like fourth or fifth in the rotation or something. So that was not a real set. Um, I mean, that was not an actual location. Episode one of Empire of Terror is different from the others in one very significant way, and that is all of the Google Earth stuff, which accounts for a little over half of the episode. Um, what I wanted to do with Empire of Terror was I wanted to basically make the case that, um, that this actually happened because no one's ever heard of these names. Everybody's heard of Auschwitz. This is an ongoing theme in the entire series is everybody's heard of what the Nazis did. Nobody's heard of what the communists did. And why is that? Oh my goodness, John. Thank you very, very much. John Eden with a super chat for $99 for expenses in a heart. John, you're gonna make me cry. Thank you. That's very kind, very kind. Very, 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 very grateful for that. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to start off by literally saying, let's see where the bodies are. You know, where where are the bodies? I'm making a big claim here. I'm going to court. This is a this is an eight episode, nine hour or ten hour indictment of this system. 
and I am the prosecuting attorney and so I'm going to start with a punch to the gut. I want people to realize that I'm not jerking anybody around here that this is what's actually happened. 100,000 people murdered in Moscow alone. Where's the receipts? Well, here's the receipts. 60,000 people in that field, 40,000 people in that field, 10,000 people under this one concrete marker alone, just their ashes, obviously. And so all of the stuff... Um, <laughs> Ace of Fendi says, it takes a big man to cry, Bill. Of course, it takes an even bigger man to laugh at the first man for crying. Ace, you're a guy after my own heart, pal. That's 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 my sense of humor, and that, that's, that's just chef's kiss for that one. Um, uh, <laughs> so the first episode is unique in that it's the only one that deals with Google Earth because I had to deal with Russian with Moscow today and we could have sent a crew over there but first of all Ukraine secondly I don't think they would let us shoot in there thirdly we didn't need it and more importantly than that I wanted it to be the kind of thing where people could look for themselves it's like that's why I was the, the final graphics for that they did a the, the, the art design in Empire of Terror and the main title sequence is just so incredibly good the set designs are so incredibly good it's great working with great people editing is superb the, the second episode, which should be releasing any time now if it's not already open, starts off with uh, the sealed train, and the editors built this train sequence. It's just top quality work. But that opening title for Empire of Terror, which are consistent throughout the series, just the music, and it's just fantastic. I love it. Um, so, uh, where the heck was I? Um, oh, so Google Earth. Uh, so there is no more Google Earth in the series. It was just that first half of the first episode saying, this is there right now, and you can go stand in this field right now. You take a walk on this field. It's unmarked. It's just a, just a gate. And beyond it is just a field, and there's 60,000 innocent people, men, women, and children, underneath your feet as you walk across that field. That's what we're talking about. So don't tell me that capitalism and communism are the same thing. This is not an American city. We don't have American cities where you go down to the park to play and have 40,000 corpses murdered underneath the feet of the children who are on the swing set. So, um, there's that. Um, and uh, they... Um, and I... When I saw the episode... I was still pleasantly surprised by a number of things because the thing I'd seen previously had been months ago now. This thing was supposed to drop in November. Um, but what I saw was a, I got a raw cut, rough cut. I gave notes on the rough cut. Then they would send me the, the cut with my notes in it, and I'd make a second pass on notes. And that's what I saw before, but I've never seen it with the second pass of notes in, plus the sound mixing, plus the color grading and all the rest of it. I was just over the moon happy with it. I couldn't believe it. Um, but, uh, uh, bless your heart. She said, I watched the Cold War series many times. I was shocked to see you in the room at the Lubyanka. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for the question. I'm very serious about this. We just got finished talking about movie crews and film production and everything, Lady Janie. And, um, and when I tell the guys, because I will tell them tomorrow, um, when I tell the guys who did the set design and the, and the background work and the background renderings, when I tell them that um, that somebody wanted to know how we got into the basement of Lubyanka, that's not a naive question. They did superb work. Um, and uh, I don't know if I should, yeah, I might as well, just because it's fun. So that sliding door, the big, enormous, heavy steel sliding door is made out of wood. And you look down the corridor, and then if you look at the, the set walls, slides the door slides open and there's the corridor that corridor is about six feet behind the, the, the door is a real door about six feet behind that is this entire flat very high definition LED wall and so I can walk towards the corridor but I can't go down the corridor because the corridor is not real but I can walk towards the corridor make a right and then I can sit behind the wall of the Lubyanka which 
looks like it connects to the corridor, but it doesn't. And so sometimes when um, when they were relighting or, or we had a break between things or whatever, I just had a little chair back there and I'd sit behind the wall of the Lubyanka, just right of the door there. Um, now you won't see any of that because obviously I'm on camera for it. Now what's cool about that also is they built this set we ended up calling the map room, which was on the first episode, and we go there quite a bit. And so the layout of the set is, uh, if I'm the camera, I'm, I'm looking straight ahead. There's the walls, of, practical walls of the Lubyanka, practical light. These are all real things. Actual sliding door, that actually works. Video wall behind that. And then if I walk to my right and the camera pans left, then 90 degrees over to the side, they built this entire other set, which is the map room, which is the room with all the books and the pictures. That's where I go to hold up the, the photographs. And, 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 and that was beautifully done. And um, and they did. Uh, they were so thorough that they had something like a hundred and fifty photos, of th just of things, that were ready to go, uh, that were mounted, just of things. Here's the imperial family. Here's a photo of you know Archduke, Arch Archduke Michael. Or, so I I'm like Jim Phelps. You know, it's like before every episode, I'm like Mission Impossible guy. I'm like. I'll take this one. I'll need this one. This one. This one. This one. This one. Put this one on the on the on the tripod there on the easel, and yeah, we're good to go. So, it was really nice to be able to touch it. Yes, Dave Big Booty. That's exactly how they did the Mandalorian. It's the exact same technology. It's called a volume. In the Mandalorian, they had a an arc. We had a flat screen, but I believe Daily Wire, if they don't have it already, is getting a gigantic arc. Um, because they can afford to do things the right way, so it's nice to be working with them. Uh, I pitched um, season, technically they're calling this season three of uh, what we saw, because America, America's Forgotten Heroes kind of is supposed to be shot as video. I'm going to hold them up to that. Um, but uh, for the next season of what we saw, and they put the what we saw label on there at the last instant, I mean the last instant, but I like it, so it's a series. So, so episode, uh, so series one is Apollo 11, series two is the Cold War, series three an Empire of Terror. And I said, hey, I've got an idea for series four. I've been talking about this forever. I want to do series four, what we saw, the Navy. Uh, and that would allow me to tell all the World War II stories I want to tell. Plus it gets me um, John Paul Jones and it gets me um, uh, Farragut and Damn the Torpedoes and it gets me some of these um, you get the, the fight between the Virginia and the, and the Monitor, and you get all kinds of cool things. Um, and, yeah, end up with real F-14 stories. And I, and I sold it. I said, here's the thing about the Navy, guys. If we do the Navy, you're going to have a history drama. I'm, I'm aware of the line I'm about to cross here, but I can, I'm confident I can back this up. I can say you're about to have a, a history documentary about the Navy written and presented by a guy who can actually land a jet on a modern aircraft carrier. I can put an F-18 on a carrier deck. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. I could do it. They won't let me do it for real, obviously, and I don't blame them. But if we do the Navy, then, um, then I want to get out of the studio and I want to get out there to the Navy. Uh, I've been on board a uh, 688 attack sub, 688I to be specific, USS Pasadena. I've been on an Arleigh Burke destroyer. Uh, I did. <laughs> I had it. I had it. You guys are gonna. You guys are gonna think I'm making this up, but I'm not. My lifelong dream was to be on an aircraft carrier, just to go out there for a day. Just that's all I ever wanted. Uh, to me, it was the ultimate destination. You know, for 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 me. And Natasha went. Um, she went on a trip to see her daughter. And uh, and I had a choice of going on the aircraft carrier or picking her up when she got back from the airport, and so I decided I was going to do that. So that's what I did. Um, but um, I figured I'll have plenty of chances to get to an aircraft carrier. Um, anyway, I didn't get to do the aircraft carrier, but I'd like to. But what I what but I, what I want to do is um, I can I can land a jet on an aircraft carrier I really can. Oh, I'm sorry, you're talking about yourself there, Jay Coulter. So so since they won't let me do it in the aircraft carrier, they'll let me do it at Miramar. Now I did it at Miramar before I put a hundred hours into it 
um, on DCS, so I am utterly convinced I could walk into that Miramar flight simulator and fly a really pretty decent, pretty decent, I mean, I've practiced this hundreds and hundreds of times, hundreds of times. Just put me 10 miles behind the boat and um, the Super Hornet, slightly different layout, but I don't need to change a lot. I just need to know where the hook is, the gear, the flaps, those are mostly in the same place. Just let me get the, um, let me get the MFD set up and we're good to go. 10 miles behind the boat, level 800 feet, 350 knots, autopilot for the radar altimeter, auto throttles. I'll go, I'll go through that first gate. I'll go right past that carrier at 350 knots at 800 feet. Exactly. Got to about a mile hard break left, 70 degree turn, crank that velocity vector along the horizon. It starts getting a little bit low. Some left rudder starts getting a little bit high. Some right rudder, keep that baby right on the horizon, roll out of that 180 degrees at 800 feet, same altitude you broke it in, and then you've got, I don't know, 40 seconds to get from 800 feet down to 600 feet. Once you're a beam, you can't let it go past another 20 or 30 degrees. You start your start your turn to base. You got to be at, you got to be below 500 feet at the at the 90. You got to be about 380 feet at the wake. And then you got to just fly and put that velocity vector on the far end of the crotch and just the part of the aircraft carrier called the crotch and have faith in the landing gear and the hook and just fly that baby on. There's no flaring or any of that other fairy stuff that land, land pilots like myself do. I could do it. I could do it on the first pass. Nope, we're not talking about airplanes for the next hour. I just had to get that out of my system instead of wallowing my own crapulence there. Um, questions? What do we got here? So we got. I hope it's kind of light because it's. We got a road runner. We got a road rider. Chris Taylor, Eric Brake, Steve Young, Joseph Pomeroy. I'm not going to get through these. Um, let me see what I can do. I'll do them in some sort of order. Okay, so I got a road runner. I got a road rider. I got a Chris Taylor. Um, I've got Eric, Steve Young, Joseph Pomeroy. Okay, I'll, I'll get as many of these done as I can. So first of all, I'm not going to do any duplicates, I'm sorry to say. I'll just go through them and get them as fast as I can. Um, so from Roadrunner, uh, hail and well met, friend William, and to you as well, Roadrunner. Um, I've been thinking about some of the projects you have on your to-do list, and I wonder if you can possibly keep track of everything, just some of the projects. The Frank Luke script, The Colonies, Major Mace Mattingly, Story Mechanics, Empire of Terror, Taffy 3, and other Daily Wire projects, forming your own DCS squadron, and of course, keeping Empress Natasha in a good mood. How do you do it? Well, I keep Empress Natasha in a good mood by deciding to pick her up at the airport rather than go and be on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> it's worth it. Um... Uh, oh, <laughs> Don did two cases. Do your best, George C. Scott. When they come in low, I can't do it, George C. Scott. But if that pilot, if he's good, if he's real good, come in so low, he's frying chickens in a in a in a hen house. Can he get through? <laughs> Doctor Strange Love is classic. Um, okay. Uh, so how do I keep track of them? Well, I I I always um thinking about all of them and the thing that's been most disturbing about this monstrosity of a of, of four scripts four movies that I wrote that's what it is each one of these things is 80 pages each it's it's a small movie four times um, the thing that's been the hardest about it is not being able to go and touch other bases I've got I, I bought them months ago I've got a new computer over there that I haven't used for the um, story mechanics thing I've got a projection, uh, laser projection thing for that wall that's going to turn into a screen. I've got a screen at home. I've got a 10 foot long movie screen at home. It's been sitting in my house now for three and a half, four months. And I haven't even been able to bring it into the studio because I know that I cannot start working on that and get this out. This thing just was so enormous. It just kept going, but it's worth it. Um, oh, back to the, um, to the Navy thing just real fast. Um, my, my point about the being able to fly on a carrier is is just sheer crapulence if there wasn't a point to it. And it turns out there is a point. And the point is, I can talk about 
a submarine engagement in World War II, let's say, and I can have a conversation with the, about that submarine attack with the captain and maybe the executive officer of a U.S. submarine at sea. That would be kind of cool. See where I'm going with this? It would be fun to talk about um, either Midway or, or, or the Marianas Turkey shoot um, with the captain of an aircraft carrier especially if I know what I'm doing because um, I can ask him questions about about things that most I don't think that any other journalist can ask him really if I was gonna have if I was gonna have a conversation with the captain of an aircraft carrier who's also well whoever's commanding the, the, the strike group so that'd probably be an admiral on board admiral's bridge I can talk to an admiral then if Daily Wire puts their mind to it I think we can pull that off and my, my, my first question to him would be, how do you deal with the vulnerability? You have limited air assets. You're not here to protect the carrier. That's not what we have aircraft carriers for. We don't have, we don't have air wings on carriers to protect the carriers. We have air wings to go and accomplish missions. How much of your resources do you put into the strike and how much of your resources do you hold back for the defense? where are your safety margins you know what's your I mean I've done enough of the combat sim to go up there against um, you know uh, J11s and J20s even and, and uh, in I've not been flying the invisible planes um, like the F-35 which is a game changer but I've certainly had enough uh, simulated missile shot at me to know that that's not a comfortable feeling and have gone them down in flames enough times to know that that's not fun either. So as far as I'm concerned, Admiral, the way I'd like to fight this thing if it were me is to make sure that I am never in a fair fight. I don't ever want to be in a one-on-one -on -one fight. I, if, if there's enemy fighters coming up, I want to outnumber them six to one and I want to outrange them too. Um, and I want to be better than them. I want it to be a massacre. I don't want this to be a fight. I want this to be an assassination. I'd like to see what his response to that kind of question would be. Um, you know, the, the, these Nimitz-class aircraft carriers and now the Ford-class aircraft carriers are just so enormous that they can take a lot of damage. It just You think, well, one torpedo, you sink an aircraft carrier. Well, we're assuming that it's not a nuclear torpedo. I don't know how many torpedoes you could put into a Nimitz-class aircraft carrier, but I bet it'd be quite a few. Um, but you don't have to sink the ship to take it out of commission. And um, and what do you think about things like how thin the hulls are on the Arleigh Burks? And why is it that we have two point defense guns on a um, on a Ticonderoga class cruiser, either two or four, and only one or two on the Arleigh Burks? What I really mean by that, Admiral, is why don't we have twenty phalanxes on a, on a on an Arleigh Burke? Why don't we have twenty of them? I'm curious about these things. These are not the kind of questions that they're expecting to get from journalists. These are the kind of questions they would get at War College, I would imagine. Um, and just go everywhere and talk to the enlisted people, mostly. Just talk to them. And um, I, I want to talk to I want to talk to submariners. I want to talk to them. I want to talk to people who've just come off the farm, so to speak. You know, you're here. You just, you're you're here from Idaho, and you're here from Chicago. And here the three of us are. We're 600 feet below the surface of the Pacific. The pressure outside is intense. And we both know that the sub can go considerably deeper than this. I don't know how much deeper it can go, and I don't want to know. But do you ever think about this when you're going to sleep? Do you ever think about the pressure on that other side of that wall? Because I'm on this boat, and I don't. I don't think about it at all. I just realized that when I was there, when I was on the Pasadena, it never occurred to me because <laughs> because the damn thing is so so phenomenally solidly built. I mean, there's no creaking. It's like sitting. In, I've said this so many times. Being on board the USS Pasadena was like being in the back room of a Denny's 
for a private party. You know, it's just, oh, that's funny. Um, it's just so stable and and they didn't do it when i was there but they have done the, the thing where they take a you know they take a a, a a string and they'll tie it to one end of the bucket on this and another end on the other side and they'll tie the string tight and then as the sub dives the the, the thing becomes slacker and slacker and slacker because the hull's actually compressing i want to know what 20 year olds think about that or 18 year olds I want to know what an 18 year old from Chicago thinks about that I want to know what it's like I've been been fortunate enough to spend about 10 minutes up on the top of a sail um, and getting to the top of the sail is not easy um, the, this is the, the structure that many people often mistakenly refer to as the conning tower so the sail on the submarine is the part that extends up. Essentially, a submarine is just a tube that swims through the water. But on the older uh, Los Angeles class boats, they had the dive planes on the sail, but they moved them to the bow because I'm sure they're much more effective there. The dive planes are not even in play if they're on the sail until you're, you know, if you need to get that that boat down fast. I guess they put them on the sail originally because they didn't want the surface water to interfere with them and they didn't want to retract them and probably going through the ice and a bunch of other good reasons, but they're much more effective up front, so they don't have them on the front anymore. And they don't have them on the Virginias or the Seawolves, um, which is a shame because having, the, having those dive planes on the sail is so iconically American looking, but anyway, there that is. Um, anyone here ever been on a submerged submarine? I have. Um, uh, and um, anyway, I want to talk to the to the people. I want to talk to fighter pilots. Um, if I get a chance to, if they can get me on uh, the carrier, Jeremy's been on a carrier on a USO tour many years ago before he became uh, the God Emperor. He went out there with um, with a couple of guys. Uh, and um, he said the the only thing that's more dramatic than the than the trap when you come aboard on the cod the carrier onboard delivery uh, turboprop airplane one of the ugliest airplanes ever made one of the most beautiful too it's just a it's just a beast of a machine it just you're flying along and all of a sudden wham oof you know you're stopped it's about that fast so the only thing that's more alarming than that is just the, the cat shot. I'm looking forward to both, but if I really, 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 really plead and beg, which is that attractive thing to do, I would love to go on board on the back seat of a of a of a F eighteen F. I'd love that so freaking much. Maybe they'd let me go on the front seat. You can have a guy in the back and be a safety pilot. Yeah, I'm sure they'll let me do that. Um, okay, so back to the questions. Where were we? So I, the way I keep track of them, um, Roadrunner is uh, Mace Mattingly is a is a essentially a um, a, a, a technical um, tech demo for the colonies, uh, which I happen to love. Uh, story mechanics is uh, I chose that because it's easy for me. These people are. To my astonishment, friends of mine, it's easy and fun for me to talk about acting with Gary Sinise or John Voight, and you get three episodes out of it. So that's a smart deal. It's as practically as cost-effective as as um, right angles. Um, Frank Luke's script is largely done. Uh, Taffy Three is what I would do next, whether I do it with Daily Wire or not. I am going to do it. Oh, thank you very much for that very kind super chat america the free uh super chat says thank you mr whittle for the voice of reason well thank you very much america the free i love your screen name and please call me bill thank you that's very kind um but i want to i want to be able to tell the story of of the history of the navy and then i want to and then i want to talk to the guys that did it that are doing it now rather the guys that did it, even World War II guys, are just not there anymore. 
Okay, so it's a road rider, not road runner. Road rider agrees with road runner and adds to your list of duties cat servant. <laughs> yeah, I've not had a chance to do the ultrasound on um, Bean yet. I, I don't know why I'm feeling better about it than I did, but um, there's something there, and uh, and I need to get uh, I need to get that looked at, and then we'll have to deal with you know one way or another. Right now, I'm just grateful to have him back. His um, his blood sugar issues are all gone. He's a friendly. This is the thing about Bean and the thing about all cats. If you're one of those people out there who are cat haters, believe me, I was one myself. I really couldn't stand him. I just just hated him. I really hated them because I would go to people's houses and they say, oh, this is my cat. And you go to pet the cat and the cat either runs away or scratches your face off or something. And I thought, why, why do people even keep these creatures? They're just nasty. They're nasty. They're, they're, you might as well have a goldfish. The thing I didn't realize about cats was that cats are just much more private than dogs. are friendly. They'll come up to you. Oh, my dog has it going. Oh, okay. I believe I'm a good dog. Okay. Cats are like, no, I don't think so. The cats only get affectionate when it's your cat and, and, um, and so I'm glad to have um, I'm glad to have that that uh, little bean back. Very very glad um, that he's recovered from his near death experience with a going into a diabetic coma, um, which really on some level has got to been my responsibility. I, I think what probably happened was uh, I gave him the shot the six units late, and then I got up early to come in here to work on the Frank Luke script. So I gave him his morning six units early and I think the thing that most important was I didn't watch him eat uh, I usually make sure he's eating something before I give him the shot but I was kind of in a hurry so I just figured I put the food down I gave him the shot I came on in and then you know a couple hours later I get this phone call and he was not in good shape but he's he's back now so what what's going to be revealed on that um, on that ultrasound, we'll see. But I'm just counting each um, counting each day now as uh, you know as a gift, and that's really the way to look uh, at um, at all of it. And uh, uh, John Eden points out that you're facing backwards in a in a cod. Yeah, if you're interested in nothing but safety all of the seats on an airliner would face backwards. That's just com this is common sense. The airplane's never going to back into a mountain and it's never going to back into a ground. Everybody's going to be going towards the front of that cabin if you hit anything, or it doesn't have to be catastrophic even, but so you want that chair behind you. You don't want to have everything dependent on this one little waist belt and all the strain that does. You want you want to take it all through your back and butt and legs and all the rest of that stuff. Um, so in addition to Cat Servant, he says, Empire of Terror, I rejoined Daily Wire just to see these. Bless you. Will every episode be a sledgehammer to the nose? No. Um, the second episode is, um, is called uh, Bacillus. It's about how the communists got to power. The third episode is called The Ramshackle Revolution. And that's actually a tragic comedy. The Russian Revolution's hilarious. It's just genuinely funny, and, and not intentionally so. It's just one giant goat rodeo. And so episode three is actually fairly hilarious because you simply can't believe. As one example of the, of the uproarious uh, hilarity of episode three, um, the signal for the revolution was supposed to be that they were going to hoist a red lantern above the... Um, the Peter and Paul Fortress, which is just across the um, the little canal separating uh, Peter and Paul from St. Petersburg proper. Uh, and um, so they're ready to start their revolution, the, the Glorious Workers' Revolution. And they made a movie about this called October, which was completely fictional. I talk a lot about Sergei Eisenstein in, in that movie, in that episode. But anyway... Um, this is a true story. So they, they're going to launch their big revolution, and um, the signal will be for the Kronstadt sailors to, to start the attack. Will be they're going to hoist a red lantern up a flagpole. So the night comes and they're getting ready to go, and nobody um, brought a red lantern. 
Um, <laughs> so they don't have a red lantern. So the commander of the base realizes that his revolutionary cue has been forgotten by somebody. This is as communism as communism gets. So he decides he's got to get into town, so he stumbles through the mud and goes over a bridge or whatever, and he's looking around. He can't find a red lantern. He does find a purple lantern. They bring it back to the, to the fort four hours after it was supposed to start, but they can't find a way to attach it to the flagpole, which is good because otherwise we'd be talking about the glorious purple October Revolution. Um, they are going to open fire on the Winter Palace with the guns of this fort, but these guns that have been facing towards the land haven't been fired in 40 years and they're all filled with rust so they can't fire those cannon um, it's just one one damn thing after another the, the, the people defending the uh, provisional government the Kerensky government they have uh, a bunch of cadets they've got the St. Petersburg Bicycle Corps and they have a group of, uh, of specialized women soldiers called the, the Death Battalion and once the limited shooting starts, the, be the half of the death battalion just faints dead away, and the other half has to be carried out of the room in hysterics. It's just, it's just sad, man. Sad. Um, <clears throat> going back to Road Rider here. Uh, question, you know what Daily Wire plans to release the balance, and what's the schedule? I think it's one a week. It's certainly not one a month. It's one a week, I'm quite sure. Uh, he says, uh, this could be your most important work. I sure hope so. Uh, ben and Jeremy just might want to release all of them the moment Daily Wire breaks even on the cost of production. Some thoughtful person may want to put a bug in Jeremy's ear or 7,000 thoughtful persons. I learned things I never, ever knew about the Soviets and the socialists in one episode. Well, you're going to learn a lot more in the remaining seven, and thank you for saying so. I can understand the appeal of socialism to young college students. They were never told the actual events that went on under the name of socialism. If you know Peter Robinson, add uncommon knowledge to your list of places you should promote EOT, sitting in the same chair as Thomas Sowell. Peter Robinson, I did an interview with Peter Robinson for um, the opening of the Cold War um, before we opened the first episode because Peter Robinson wrote, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That was his line. Um, and I'd love to do it. Um, all I ended up doing was the was the Ben thing. I, I, I had said the only person I can think of that I'd like to really talk to about Empire of Terror is Jordan Peterson only because Jordan Peterson's the only person who ever talked about the communists the same way you would talk about the Nazis. He's the only person that gets it. They're, they're going to try and get me that um, spot on his podcast. If I get it, I don't want to talk about the details of the revolution. I want to talk about right and wrong. I want to talk about morality and, and, and I want to talk about what it means when your government has to lie to you and terrify you and intimidate you in order to get your compliance versus uh, having a, a government or an idea that's so universally true that you can have people just agree on it. Those kind of things. So thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, Chris Taylor, um, so how is that one, two, three movie I keep hearing about? Should we all run out and find a copy? I don't know. It's here on my desk. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet and I won't this week. But after that, I should start having some time of my own. That also applies to all of you who sent in about the um, DCS squadron, by the way. So um, I'm just glad to be wrapping this thing up and uh, being able to talk about it, if not in the past tense, then certainly in the present tense and not the future tense. So it's been a, a, a real slog. However, um, uh, it's been a slog in terms of the amount of work. I'm very, very, very happy with the results. And, and hopefully we'll get a chance to see that someday too. I said this about Empire Terror when we were making it. I'm sorry this has taken so long, I was saying, but I, I just think it's going to be worth it. So when, when I hear comments like yours, it means the world to me, actually. So we'll see. Um, Well, Eric has written me a very lovely um, Rod Serling introduction, which I'm afraid I'm not in the in the mood or, or the voice to perform. Uh, it's basically a question about Disney and uh, Abigail Disney, who basically criticized Disney. Now is wondering why Disney's not why Disney is ruining its its legacy. Um, 
Disney is as done as any product I've ever seen. It's, um, there was something I saw called the worst business speech ever. And it was about a guy in England who apparently in, in business schools, this is legendary, he destroyed a multi, multi, multi million dollar business in about 10 minutes. Um, basically, uh, <laughs> sorry, Eric, I just, I just, I'm just not, I'm just not in the Rod Serling mood right now. Um, uh, but this guy had a cheap jewelry store and he sold cheap jewelry and people, was it Sam Fried? I don't remember his name, but he was a British businessman and he, and he sold inexpensive jewelry and it was, um, yeah, I'm awful sorry about that, Eric. I really am genuinely sorry I didn't get, get to do it, but Abigail Disney has the first generation, Walt and, and Roy built the company. And then there were the, um, uh, what was his name? Eisner years where he basically maintained and grew this empire and then Iger and then it just collapses into this woke cesspit of mediocrity. Mike, Mike Rowe has a line that I really liked a lot. He says, focus groups make sure that mediocrity rises to the middle. And that's exactly what you're getting. Um, but anyway, back to this guy. So he sold this inexpensive jewelry and he did a convention or something like that, a business convention. And he basically got on there and he was on camera and he said, he basically said, um, our people, our, our customers are idiots. I mean, this stuff is junk. We sell junk at outrageous prices. It's cheaper than real jewelry, but it's just, they're paying for junk. I don't, I don't know what the hell is the matter with them. And word got out, it turns out that people don't like being considered chumps and idiots by the people that are selling them things, so the, the business eventually just collapsed and he, he just ended up in utter poverty. He opened his mouth for 10 minutes and destroyed this enormously thriving empire. Yeah, was it Ratner? He said, we sell cheap crap. Um, LaFell says, really, do you see Hollywood going recovery or going to be woke? I don't think it's going to be either. I just think people are stopped watching it. Nobody cares. I haven't watched, um, I haven't watched the Oscars in 20 years. I, not only do I not watch it, I can't stand the idea of watching it now. Uh, the thing I talked with Mike Rowe about at some length on that podcast was that modern movies are so terrible because the people that are writing them never had any life experiences. Everything they get, they get secondhand. Rod Serling and, and Gene Roddenberry were, were, were combat veterans. And so was Jim Doohan, and you know, and Jim Doohan was a special forces guy. I mean, they, all, all of these guys had something to write about, and so did everybody else prior to the digital age. And everybody prior to the digital age would go out and face real world problems. Now, this is the this is how we this is what we experience the world through. We we, we see the world through. Well, we used to see it. I'm, I'm 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 I know people must have already done this, but I still think I haven't seen it. And I would love to see just a parody where people, you go to a movie theater and the movie theater is just packed full of people. It's 10 years from now and the movie screen is, is in this format. I just think that'd be hilarious. Now with the tallest screen ever and, and there's all these people sitting in the room and the whole movie is shot in this ridiculous format. This, this, this format, this, this portrait format is awful you can't see anything and the only reason that you do it is because this is how you hold the phone if you're an idiot it's not so hard to hold the phone like this this produces an incredible image but this no um so uh i think hollywood is done i don't uh, all the people i'm interested in are not excuse me they're not in hollywood they're they're on youtube I would like to try an experiment when we get to the colonies where we're using YouTube networks of people like Critical Drinker and, and, and um, uh, you know, just everybody, just linking them all together. Um, needless to say, I'm, I'm reluctant to speak the name Doomcock because terrifies me so much but all of those things together and 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 you know the 
the way to get something really amazingly done is there are so many like take the colonies for example there's no way I can do the colonies by myself I'm not, not that naive although I'm very naive but it's also not lost on me that I see if you look and you know what you're looking for and you have a good eye there are so many people out there that are doing amazing special effects for free and some of them are probably 16 years old it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how old they are it just matters what's the work look like and the work is incredible and it seems to me that you could not only make one movie but you could put together quite a quite a good studio by going out there and finding this young talent that's really genuine talent because there are people out, they don't have to be young but they don't they don't have to be costing you you know seven thousand dollars an hour either most of the stuff I see on YouTube in terms of the best effects people are just doing it just for practice just to get good at it and now with Unreal 5 I've seen a number of outdoor videos in Unreal 5 where I honestly truthfully could say if they weren't moving the Sun around I would have no way to tell that this is a computer generated image no way to tell and when and, and I've got a highly trained eye not just a trained eye I have a highly trained eye for this uh, and if you get to the point where you can no longer tell whether you are in location in the pyramids or as I've said many times starting five years ago we have the technology now for us to shoot Lawrence of Arabia in this room and do it in such a way that you could never tell I mean you would just have to go I'm not saying we don't pay these people I'm just saying most of these people will work some of them are already doing work for game studios and so on but even some of those guys who are really the best of the best I think you could get a fair number of those guys for a reasonable amount of money if you told them they were making a movie instead of a video game because uh, you know I think that pendulum has swung in the other direction there was for the last 20 years it's like who wants to make movies when you can do stuff for video games now it's like Right, there's millions of video games. Starfield came and seemed to fall flat on its butt. Like he's made, I, I, I'm still waiting for it to be released. It turns out it's been released for months, months. I thought this was going to come and kill Star Citizen. Star Citizen, which I thought was dead on arrival, stone cold dead, is now starting to pick up some steam and get things done. So you never know how these things are going to go. Steve Whoop says video games make more money, but video games are harder on the on the artists because they've got these crunch deadlines and the thing to do is just to get you know farm it out you can have all these different people working on a project all you need is one filter that would be me so that everything looks like it belongs in the same movie that's essentially what a director does is he just makes sure that all the inputs from the actors the lighting directors all of this stuff it all looks like it's going in the same movie that's that's essentially it uh, I still have uh, another couple of hours of work to do here before I can go home. Let's see what we can get to do with this. So, um, let me just look here. Okay, I've got two to go. Um, and I don't want to let anybody down. All right, I'll just do them then. Um, Steve Young says, Good evening, Bill. In the Hunger Games, Mockingjay, the District 13 propaganda videos, propos, the rebellion just showed the truth about the Capitol. In political messaging production is... In political messaging production is truth, lies, or the suppression the most effective form of, of messaging? Well, truth is always the most effective form of messaging, which is why we have no one to blame but ourselves. When we got truth on your side, we should, this should be a slam dunk for us. We had this example uh, earlier in the show of somebody who saw the most um, shameful injustice and realized, wait a minute, a lot of what I believe is if this guy's right, and he seems to be right, he's bringing the receipts, then a lot of what I believe is based on false information that's been fed to me, and I might have to change my mind on this. This is what the power of the truth is. And and I, I'm always on the side of the truth because I'm too lazy to invent the things I need to invent in order to be lying all the time uh, and if it turns out I'm wrong about where the truth is then I'll move so being able to tell the truth is the whole thing but the problem is is that people who are on the side of the truth are lazy it's like well we don't have to defend this it's the truth 
well, there are people out there who realize what, you know, what Joseph Goebbels realized. If you're going to lie, tell a big lie and tell it often and tell it loudly. And over time, people will begin to believe it just through social proof. Um, I found this when I was writing the Frank Luke thing. There were a number of things that were very idealistic about this. And I thought, oh, you know, the cynical. What was all this? What did it accomplish? This guy's killed and Werner's killed and all. For what? What, what, what actually happened so that we could get Adolf Hitler in World War II? Is that what this was all about? You know, that cynical voice comes back in. Um, and uh, and it's just, you know, it's just pervasive. So, so these people who are not on the side of the truth understand that they got to be lying all the time, and they have to be lying well. And so the evolution, I don't mean actual evolution, I just mean sort of a, a cultural evolution, means that they have to be good at lying about things, and so they are. And um, and I saw I saw this when I first saw Bowling for Columbine. I saw Bowling for Columbine at a theater in Santa Monica, surrounded by liberals. And when I was done, I thought, man, I must be wrong about conservatism because he makes so many good points. And it wasn't until I got in the car, got out of that theater, and started driving home that I started, wait a minute now, wait a minute, ho hold on, wait, wait, wait. The, and then I realized, no, he's he's an extraordinarily gifted liar when he's at his peak. He edits things out of sequence, he, he tells partial truths, he does all of the things that you can do to lie effectively, and they're all very good at it. So if we had anything like the amount of talent they have in storytelling, this would have been over a long time ago because our story's so much better than theirs. But it's not. So we get lazy because we've got the truth and they have to work like, like uh, animals to keep lying because they, they're antithetical to the truth. Hope that's enough for you. Joseph Pomeroy? Yeah, that's it. All right, so we'll do this. this is a little longer one, but that's good. We don't get to hear from Joseph too often, so let's do this. Good evening, Bill. Good evening, Joseph. I have two questions tonight, exclamation point. I like a man with enthusiasm. I just wrapped up a first watch of Band of Brothers by HBO. I'm in the process of watching Masters of the Air, and it made me think of a question. When bringing a real story to the big screen, how much is too much? The reason I ask this is because, this is a great question, is because in Masters of the Air Episode 3, there's a mission, the first of its kind in the war, where the B-17s take off from England, bomb deep into Germany, and then fly to Africa. In real life, this mission had 11 out of 21 bombers that made up the focus of this miniseries lost in the raid. Yet during a slow motion scene, there's a panning of the point of view inside a cockpit. From this vantage point, there are three separate B-17s burning out of the sky, two BF-109s bursting into flames, and enough flack to walk across Germany. There's just so much crap in the way that in the words of Mr. Plinkett, you don't recognize it, but your brain does, and it takes away from the heroism and determination that these men faced. Contrast that with Dune 2. I think Dune 2 is the best sci-fi movie ever put to screen. Wow. That leads me to my second question. So let me answer the first question first. Yes, if you finished watching Band of Brothers and then you watched Masters of the Air, you'll notice that you have no desire to see Masters of the Air again. I this is another example, like Oppenheimer and like um, uh, Napoleon, where I was fascinated and interested by it, and then I just suddenly just didn't care at all. Why? Well, the reason I don't care about uh, Masters of the Air and, and the reason I haven't seen a single episode of it, even though I've got the Apple streaming service, I think I do anyway, um, uh, the reason I don't care is because... Uh, <laughs> Dave Big Booty called uh, <laughs> called Michael Moore Tubby Riefenstahl. That's funny. Um, the special effects in Band of in Band of Brothers was so minimal that you didn't know there were special effects. Obviously, if you're going to blow up buildings and have rocket launchers and tanks and things like that, there's a special effects crew there. But those special effects are all practical. Those are real world squibs and real world explosions. And and to the extent that they use CG, they didn't overdo it. This is the cardinal sin of, of, of filmmaking these days. Because, because, because computer graphics allow you to put the camera everywhere, people put the camera in places where the camera could never be, and they think it's more dramatic to have the plane come over like this, but, but no one's ever seen a plane do that. So it takes you out of the picture. They think it's more dramatic and more exciting, and on some purely sensory level, they're probably right, 
but it's telling your brain that this isn't real. If you look at, on the other hand, if you look at um, uh, Top Gun Maverick, there's a lot of CG in that movie. You just can't tell where it is because they shot the CG airplanes the way they should, would shoot real airplanes, meaning you've got these things coming through the canyon and there's a guy on a hill and he's panning around and he's following the jets through the canyon. That's what it would look like in real life if they were real jets. And, and so when I first saw the first clips coming out of Masters of the Air, I had three thoughts. Number one, the CG is ridiculous. It's ridiculous in the way that that recent Midway movie was from a couple years ago with um, Woody Harrelson in, in it. There's so much CG that it's just absurd. You don't have to have... Mid, the Battle of Midway has enough drama in it so that you don't have to have this guy pulling out of his bombing run on one of these Japanese aircraft carriers and then going so low that he dips a wing in the water and then and then flies off because if you dip a wing in the water you don't fly away the second that wing contacts the water the plane just cartwheels and you're dead but they have to do it they can't resist no no it's a, we got to make it more dramatic more dramatic than what sinking the entire japanese uh, surface force uh, sinking kido butai in 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 6 minutes you're going to have to make that more dramatic really what's the matter with you and they put so much flack in the sky like you say it's like it's absurd and it's, and it's an insult to these guys because what they're trying to do is they're trying to make it video game dramatic and it's like your video games, th this is what happens when you give a World War II story to, to millennials and, and, and Gen Zers or Gen Xers, people who've never had any experience with this. You don't have to add drama. This was the thing I liked about the Frank Luke thing. I could tell this story 100% accurately and I didn't have to exaggerate anything because what happened in real life was better than anything I could come up with. Um, so this is this is why it's just terrible. It's terrible. Um, it, it ruined uh, Masters of the Air. I have no desire to see it. One because of the CG. Number two, because the characters are wearing oxygen masks. Now that would not be a problem. It is a problem. I mean, you've got a practical problem here. In Band of Brothers, when these guys are under attack, you get to see the actors and get to see their expressions. And you've got some great, 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 great actors in Band of Brothers. And that's what sold the story. Now, when you're in um, Masters of the Air, you have to have their face covered up by oxygen masks because they had to have the oxygen masks. They're at 20,000 feet, 18,000 feet or higher. And, um, and so you're, you, you've taken away virtually all of the actor's ability to express himself. That's a genuine, genuine problem. But the reason that, they, that they're not helping themselves is that for um, Masters of the Air, they cast pretty people. They didn't cast real looking people. They cast people that had kind of a 40s kind of a look to them, but, they, but they're all just too good looking for this, you know? There's nobody with bad teeth in, 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 um, in Masters of the Air. There's nobody with like super prominent noses or, or you know, unibrows or anything. They go out and they hire, you know, Good looking actors. This is why this is why Mr. Spock was so effective, is because Leonard Nimoy is a strange, strange, strange looking dude. He is a very bizarre looking individual. He does not look human. That's why Spock works. The Spock they've got on Strange New Worlds, who looks like he was, you know, looks like I almost called him a barista at Starbucks, but that would have been too interesting. He he looks like a guy who's who's like taking your parking ticket at LAX or something, and and this is his his paying his rent job while he's you know studying for acting school. It's just plain awful. It's awful. The guy on, the, the the guy who plays Pike on Strange New World. Now that guy's got a unique look. That's why he's interesting. You can't tell me anything about anybody else on that show. I can't I can't think of another face on that show. I can't think of any faces on Discovery except for. Um, Michael Jesus and she's famous for being wooden look at the people they cast in a great example much better example clear example look at um, Rings of Power okay so you've got Galadriel who's this kind of she looks kind of like she could be a surfer chick or something contrast that with um, with Galadriel in, in the real Lord of the Rings with Kate Blanchett Kate Blanchett is 
otherworldly looking. She's, she's ethereal. She's a strange looking woman. And when you light her correctly, and she's an excellent actress, you give her that kind of aura, and she doesn't look like she's of this world. But this Galadriel in Rings of Power is just running through the water. He's right on her face. It's, you know, Ooh, I'm on a horse. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So Big Booty says, see also Tilda Swinton. Yes, Tilda Swinton is not a normal looking person. Aragorn, for example. Aragorn, Viggo Morganson's Aragorn is not pretty. He's not a handsome guy. He's a good looking guy, but he's not a handsome guy. He's certainly not a pretty guy. He's got an odd face. And and he's a brilliant actor. He's one of the best actors I've ever seen. Everybody that they put in that Peter Jackson cast has a very unusual face. Legolas looks like he's otherworldly. He, he, he's he's a he is made up to look like and and say nothing of Gimli who really is kind of the heart and soul of that that story to be honest with you. Um and, and it just goes down the list, you know, all of them. They've just, they've all just got such unusual faces. Liv Tyler is, you know, she's, she's almost unbelievable. Those eyes, of blue eyes and, and her look. And she's not exactly classically pretty either. So, the, so they, so they, Basically, in Masters of the Air, they just cast, you know, oh, this guy's kind of got a 40s vibe on him, but it's just another actor, another Hollywood guy, no character in that face, no character at all, none. Um, so that's the second problem. And then the third problem is um, Band of Brothers works because there's, because there's a center of Band of Brothers. That's why Band of Brothers works, and that's why The Pacific didn't work, and that's why Masters of the Air doesn't work is that there's no center and the center is um is dick winners and um damien uh, what's his name if you take dick winners out of band of brothers you've got the pacific or you've got masters of the air and without dick winners you've got a collection of short stories but with dick winners you've got We've got Band of Brothers, Damien Lewis, yeah. Uh, that actor and that real-life character were such a potent combination together that Band of Brothers is the story of Dick Winters going through the war. Now, as the story progresses, as the series progresses, you see less and less and less of Winters, but he's always there. And Ron Livingston, yes, and Ron Livingston is a, is an unusual looking guy. All of the guys in Band of Brothers are unusual looking guys, and and Spielberg did the same thing, the same correct thing. He produced Masters of the Air. I don't know why he didn't learn his own lessons, but you look at Saving Private Ryan. Who do you have? You have Vin Diesel. That's a strange looking guy. You got Barry Pepper. That's a that's a face. Barry Pepper. Barry Pepper's got a face. He's he's a memorable guy. Neil McDonough. All these guys. They're unusual. They're characters. And and. Masters of the Air just has these pretty people, and I don't believe them at all. And they're lazy. I, 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 I was looking forward to the clips. I saw the CGI, and I thought, oh, come on. And then I just finally stopped even looking at the clips. I haven't seen a single episode. I stopped looking at the clips when I realized everybody's saying, Roger that. Uh, you have Balter, are you ready? Roger that. I don't think they ever said Roger that in those days. I don't think they ever used the term, Roger that is what cool pilot talk is. You know, Roger that, did you get that? Roger that, Roger that, Roger that, Roger that, Roger that, Roger that. Yeah, it sounds really cool. Except I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It sounds like a person who has heard of pilots, never met one, and and has some vague idea of what they're supposed to sound like. Roger that. Oh, look how cool he sounds. Not trying to sound cool, man. He wants to be understood. Roadrunner says Roger Wilco. Yeah, Wilco. Roger Wilco is a. There was somebody did a piece on this. I think it might have been in Flying Magazine or some other aviation book or something. They said it's a shame that Roger Wilco became so corny that they even named a video game after Roger Wilco. But they said it's a shame because Roger Wilco is actually an extremely, extremely effective and very concise 
message. If somebody gives you instructions, you say Roger Wilco. That Roger means I have heard and understood your transmission, and Wilco means I will comply. Roger Wilco is 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 it's perfect. Roger Wilco. Um, Roger does not mean affirmative, by the way, and I saw them doing that in 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 um, uh, in Masters of the Air. At least I'm pretty sure I did. Do you have that 50 cal loaded yet? Roger. Let's try that again. I just asked you, do you have the 50 cal loaded yet? And you say you have heard and understand my message, but that's not what I'm asking. Do you have the 50 cal loaded yet? Affirmative or negative? Oh, affirmative. Thank you. That's what I was waiting for. Now back to your show. Um, Roger does not mean affirmative. And, and, and you have to know these things. You know, if somebody says uh, two six Bravo turn uh, turn left on uh, Taxiway Lima, you can't just say Roger. You have to say turn left on Taxiway Lima two six Bravo. They need a read back. They don't need a yes. I heard you. They they need to know that you heard the correct thing. Breaker one nine radio check got the frequency for you. You moron. It's, uh, Steve Young at work. All right, second half of his question, then I'm going back to doing what I was doing, and then I'm going home, home to my minky. Uh, don't worry, I have a license for my minky. And that's a genius right there, Peter Sellers. That's a genius. Do you have a license for your minky? You see the outtakes of that. They're just He's just crying. He's laughing so hard. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, I may put this on ephemera. I haven't updated that for a while yet either. Um, go to uh, YouTube and search for um, being there and credits outtakes. Um, because Chauncey Gardner has a scene where he's confronted by some thug on the street. And he says, and he's, he's asked to read it back. Do you remember what he said? I believe so. He said, you tell that asshole Louise that if I and he's just reading it back and Sellers just keeps cracking up it's just he's having so much fun he's having so much fun it's that's why they included it as a uh, Easter egg on the on the credit roll for being there which is a great movie if you've never seen being there it's one of the greatest films ever made it's a fantastic film uh, back to the second one uh, so, uh, the first question was, do you believe you can go too far? Yes, of course you can, and they, it's much more likely to go too far than not far enough these days. Which means that, coming up on number two, do you believe that Dune 2 proves the scale of Warhammer 40k is achievable for such efforts as Amazon's upcoming series with Henry Calville? Uh, I haven't seen Dune 2, but I saw Dune 1. I thought Dune 1 captured the scale of things magnificently. Um, I had heard that Calville was doing his 40k series. I did not know he was doing it with Amazon. I'm concerned about that. However, apparently Calville walked off of The Witcher because it was too much unlike The Witcher, and he knows... Calville has my undying respect. He's a fan as well as a fine actor. Um, so I have hope that, um, that uh, this will be good. Yes, the scale of 40k is, is part of 40k. Um, We'll see. Um, he goes on to say, whereas the amount of exploding planes took me out of Masters of the Air, Dune Tune was masterfully made with CGI on a cheap budget too for what it did and allowed your eye to focus on both the near and far very fluidly. In a single 15 minute span towards the climax, the camera goes from a dark underground labyrinth to an open field of nuclear detonation followed by two close scenes in both a sandstorm and a throne room. Every single character, extra and CGI soldier was carefully made that if your eye looked at it, then there was no, that if your eye looked at it, there was a tension there. Yes, because people stand, that's great. The body language of people is something that we all, that's another one of those Mr. Plinkett examples. You don't notice it, but your brain does. Um, so I can't wait to see it. I guess I answered my own questions, but I enjoy your take on these type of techniques. And I think that if Frank Luke becomes a four part miniseries, it can become a gripping tale that can safely ascend the pantheon of historical legacies boy i sure hope so he deserves it 
Frank Lucas, the fullback in this country, needs to get a little backbone back if you would like Exhibit A and the strength of men that are coming due these days, these hard times. Look toward the Republican candidate for North Carolina, Governor Mark Robinson. That dude is not going to be swayed by a purple-haired, Starbucks-drinking, tut-tutting, morally bankrupt fiend. Boy, that is a fine, fine conclusion there, Joe. Always a pleasure. Can't wait to for the squadron in DCS. Would love to hear what names we can get to go for for a squadron. Um, all the best from Joe. Uh, I have given this some serious thought, and I think we're going to be doing a fictional squadron, and, and I think we'll probably be um, um, VFA-77 uh, Trash Pandas. I thought, eh, it's a little flip, but they got the puking dogs. You know, they've got um, got a number of things that are self-referential. So I like the trash pandas. Um, and uh, and I'm looking forward to doing that very, very much. You have no idea how much I'm looking forward to doing that. All right, I think that'll do it. I'm hungry also. It's starting to sound like a refinery here. Um so let's wrap this up, why don't we, the way we usually do, and that is that uh, this guy and this guy and all the rest of this, this guy here uh, are all made possible by the members of BillWhittle.com who have stuck with us through thick and thin, and we're starting to get out of the thin and into the thick, I think. That's what I think, I think, I think. Um, so for those of you who are members, you have my undying gratitude, as well as the rest of us part of this little family. And for those of you who are regular viewers live of the show, um, if you've only watched it recorded, it's so much more fun to be here in person. So hopefully we'll get a chance to see you there. At 105 viewers on YouTube right now, that's astonishing to me. I know it's not a big number by some standards, but the fact that 100 people sit and listen is just mind-blowing. And I uh, thank every one of you for being here, and I'm very grateful for your presence. It's the smartest crowd in all of show business, and I always feel better when I, um, when I do these shows. No matter how tired I might be or whatever the case may be, I always just end up feeling great. Thank you especially for all the kind words um, about everything, and especially about the things like Empire of Terror and Frank Luke, which put an, in, believe it or not, put an enormous psychological burden on me that I'm um, that I'm short sheeting or short changing the people that are paying for content and to hear um, hear these kind of uh, these kind of comments from people, especially from members, is an enormous load off of my conscience and my shoulders. So. Thank you for all of that. Okay, we'll say goodnight to YouTube first. So, uh, YouTube, there you are. See ya. Uh, hello, YouTube. Hello, YouTube. We will 